Good afternoon. Uh, today is Thursday, November 30th, uh, and this is the Education and Culture Committee. I'm the chair of the committee, Will Jawando. I'm joined by my colleagues, Council Members Albernaz and Mink, and also uh -huh. by Council Members Friedson and Lukey, uh, who are always welcome to the Education and Culture Committee. Uh, we have two uh, um, important and uh, very meaty items on the agenda today. Uh, related to first being the MCPS anti-racist audit and the implementation plan, uh, and the second, uh, the implementation of restorative justice practices in MCPS. So related, but obviously separate topics. Uh, and it's good to see all of our folks who are here. I often say the millions watching at home, but we, you know, we have a good, good number of folks in the audience today, and I'm sure we have some people online as well. Um, just as framing, uh, you know, this council, one of the first things that uh, council members Albernaz, Friedson, and I got to participate in when we joined the council in 2019 was to pass a racial equity and social justice law uh, to try to chart a course for county government and for this uh, county and every branch of the government, MCPS included, to make sure that we had an anti-racist, socially just system. Uh, we know we're working on something that's been literally centuries in the making and you're not going to do that overnight. Um, but uh, the, our first item and both items really are a part of that effort. Um, and obviously we're living in a time right now where there is a lot of concern for many communities. Um, I was just at the anti-hate task force final meeting earlier this week uh, and many of the recommendations, and this is a representative group from all communities, uh, were related to what can MCPS do uh, to do better and to make sure we're a more welcoming, safe community uh, for, every, for everyone. Um, and I committed there and I'll commit again here to taking up all of those recommendations. The council will be briefed on Tuesday uh, on those recommendations, uh, but those that relate to MCPS and education and culture, we will be having sessions uh, on those recommendations and on that work. Uh, for all the communities that are impacted. Uh, obviously, we've seen a dramatic rise in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and anti-LGBTQ hate um, and, of course, racism as well. And it's unacceptable. Uh, Montgomery County uh, should be a place where everyone has the opportunity to be them, their full authentic selves uh, and to express that. Um, the context of this hearing, uh, obviously, is focused primarily this first item on communities of color. And I just want to frame that. That does not mean we aren't concerned about all communities. We absolutely are. Uh, but this work is a years long process as we will hear. Um, and I'm going to read directly from the website. The anti-racist system audit it was a, is a comprehensive and powerful district wide review of Montgomery County Public Schools practices and policies based on input from more than 130,000 students, staff, and family members. Uh, the review was conducted because of racial disparities that can be seen in almost every area of MCPS, including reading levels, participation in higher level classes, graduation rates, suspension, and discipline rates, and <laughs> staffing. The report that we'll hear about provides a comprehensive picture of how race impacts the experience of students and families. Overall, students and families of color reported having a less satisfactory experience with MCPS than other members of the community. Now, that's a quote directly from the report. We want everyone in our community to succeed. Uh, this is a delving into an important, again, centuries long topic uh, and about how MCPS is addressing that issue. We will come and continue to address these other issues as well. Um, and uh, I was informed earlier today that there was a racist incident at one of our high schools. Uh, at Northwest High School, and so it underscores how important this is. There's obviously the overt acts of hate and racism, but just as importantly, and maybe more insidiously, insidiously is the covert, the things that deny access to opportunity uh, and happen and have been happening in this country for a long time. So I wanted to frame that um, because I know we're in a very important time in our county and state and country and world history. Uh, and we can balance all these things at the same time. We care about all of our students and all of our community members. Um, so I'll pause there. Uh, this is an important topic, uh, if, and so we're going to dive right in. Is there anything 
from staff that we need to tee up? No, I think we're all set to go to MCPS's presentation. Wonderful. So if our colleagues from MCPS could come up. Thank you. And you can introduce yourselves and jump right in. Great. Thank you so much um, for inviting us here today to talk about this topic. My name is Stephanie Sharon, and I'm the Chief of Strategic Initi Initiatives. And with me today is... Good morning. My name is... Good afternoon. My name is Dr. <laughs> Anthony Olson. I am the Director of the Equity Unit. So I actually want to thank uh, Councilmember Jawando for addressing some of the talking points that we were going to already uh, touch on. So now we can kind of move a little bit Feel faster. Feel free to skip them. Yeah, yep, I'm going to skip them. I don't need to be repetitive um, with what you said. But like I said, uh, like I said just, just now was uh, we appreciate this opportunity to be able to provide you a brief overview of both our audit findings as well as the actions that we have taken since the audit was um, done. The audit was completed in October of last year, and then the action plan was developed and presented to the public on May 11th. So we will talk about um, both of those things this morning, or this afternoon, I should say. So to understand the actions that we're taking, I think it's also Im important to understand the context for which the audit was created as well as the level of community engagement that was involved around this work. And lastly, a brief overview of the findings like we stated below. So we can go to the next slide. And this is where uh, Council Member Jawando kind of teed up our talking points right here. But the anti-racist audit um, is aligned to the goals of the Racial Equity and Justice Act that Council Member Jawando just mentioned. And um, the goal is to ultimately reduce and eliminate the racial and other disparities that we see in our students so that every child in Montgomery County Public School feels safe, valued, seen, and heard. Um, it also aligns with what Dr. McKnight said um, when we implemented the audit, audit. She said that we commissioned this audit because beneath every stone we turned over, on every indicator of student opportunity, we found undeniable racial disparities that have existed for decades. So what's important to understand about what was different about the anti-racist audit, one of the things that we heard a lot from the community is you've done audits before, you've done studies before, and we're still seeing the perpetual achievement gaps create, uh, be created and, and happen. And the difference between the anti-racist audit report and the other reports that we have done is that a lot of the other studies that have been done with, for MCPS over the years, over the decades, I should say, really focused on specific issues in isolation of each other. The uniqueness of the anti-racist audit is that we took a look at the entire system and how the entire system was functioning inter in an interconnected way to address these, these disparities. So really taking that systems level approach to this work. So the information that we're sharing with you today is gonna to be a long-term plan. It is a long-term plan to address what has been an intractable problem that we have seen in the district and has been actually built into the structures of MCPS when it was created as a segregated school system. So as we go through our presentation today and when you read through the anti-racist action plan, I believe we gave you paper copies of just the, the public version of it so that you had a reference to it. You're not gonna see a lot of like brand new flashy programs, initiatives, big budget items associated with this. But rather this action plan outlines the comprehensive and methodical steps that it really takes to change the culture, policies and practices in an organization as large as MCPS, because the action plan, this action plan is really designed to build the capacity of our staff to have an anti-racist mindset while also creating the structures needed to hold us accountable to do the work. Next slide, please. So before we jump in, I think it's critical that we're all operating under the same lens of understanding when we say anti-racism, how are we defining it? So there are four levels of racism that we examine and address within MCPS. There is individual racism, where you're dealing with individual interactions or an individual's view, uh, beliefs and actions that serve to per uh, perpetuate oppression. You have interpersonal, right, which is where it's between people. Where the anti-racist action plan lies is in the systemic. This is where you look at institutional racism, policies and practices at the organizational level that perpetuate oppression, things that have been in place that we think of as regular operating procedures, structural racism, how these effects interact and accumulate across institutions and across history. 
prime example is when we had students returning from COVID. We know structurally that our students experienced the COVID-19 pandemic in a very, very different way. And when we brought them back, that was apparent. So part of our job as a school system is to think about a school system that has basically been not unchanged for over 100 years and designed for one segment of our population. And how are we really dismantling some of these structures and creating a place that's really gonna be effective for all? So you can see in your, in your um, document right here that you have is on page 14, you will see a more comprehensive definition of anti-racism and specifically what anti-racism looks like in our structure. Next slide, please. So as I stated uh, previously, the unique uh, quality of the anti-racist audit is that it did take a look at our system holistically through six domains. The audit examines school culture, workforce diversity, working conditions, pre-K through 12 curriculum, community relations and engagement, and equity of access. And they developed and identified observations, findings, and recommendations in each area. Next slide. Wanted to share um, and just show you this slide for you all to see the number of organizations and community groups that were involved in not just the anti-racist audit process, but even from the inception of creating what the audit was going to look like. We had an anti-racist um, audit steering committee that was developed and served, and, and we, had, we had members come in and out of this over the course of over two years that worked on the development of the anti-racist audit, that worked on the um, implementation of the audit, and provided feedback and input on the action plan um, for the anti-racist audit. Next slide. And as Council Member Jawando noted um, in his opening remarks, we had over 130,000 students, family members, and staff participate in the anti-racist audit. Um, you can see, if you look at the audit report, which is located online, um, you can see starting on page 37 of that report, you can see all of the specific observations and recommendations and findings made for each of the six domains. This graphic up here just shows you all the different data collection opportunities and tools that were done over the approximately two year process. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Alston, who's going to dive in um, a little bit deeper into the findings and some of our actions thus far. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. So in addition to the 26 observations in those six domains, the anti-racist audit report also provides us with a holistic cross-domain analysis, looking at what are the key systemic actions that we need to look at. And so the report stated that the implementation of policies or implementation of applications of best practices differed greatly from school to school. In essence, it suggested that our system was currently fragmented. So the report went on to recommend five, five specific cross-domain or systemic actions that we needed to explore. The first recommendation is coherence. The report stated that we need to one, build on current MCPS strategic plan by developing a theory of change, a theory of change that would center racial equity and incorporating into the action plan. It highlighted the need to co-construct a plan with the community by utilizing organizational elements and thirdly, engage in consistent communication with the community. So as you can see from the slide, the next recommendation is the accountability for our racial equ equity work, which is being transparent with racial equity work and develop public accountability measures and metrics and regularly communicate the progress of MCPS's work towards racial equity goals. Next slide, please. The last three recommendations are the equity-centered racial equity work, continuous data collection, and relational trust. All these are aligning themselves to the work and the actions with words. The idea is summed up well from the following quote from a parent participant. I graduated in the 90s. Since that time, I've seen very little change in the achievement gap and support for black and Hispanic students. So the question to me 
is not about how well MCPS seeks input and participation on policies, but how well they hear what families of color are experiencing and making the necessary resource changes to support populations that need the most support. With this in mind, we spent a great deal of time co-developing our action steps through a series of processes and structures. So this slide before you outlines the steps that we took to develop the action plan to address the findings that came out in the audit. We started with 19 community conversations. Each conversation was organized either by the community, by students, or by staff partners. The conversations were adapted to meet their specific needs of each group. Those community conversations were led by my unit, the Equity Initiatives Unit. We were able to then take all the observations and recommendations along with the feedback from the community conversations, and we then brought together 100 of the central office leaders together for two full-day work sessions. Each department was then responsible for taking their learning back to their respective departments to support their staff in the learning and understanding. The departments were then charged to ultimately create 32 safe to fail experiments that would address the findings and, potential and specific actions that we could take. From there, we developed six cross office teams that we call charters. We took a look at all the information, developed short and long-term action steps, which eventually became what you have in front of you now, the Anti-Racist System Action Plan. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the Anti-Racist System Action Plan and the deliverables were presented to the board, as stated previously, and the community last May. You have a copy of the action plan and the deliverable documents are also live um, for all to see in a link to our system website. We will plan to give a report of the impact of these actions at the end of each year. Keeping in mind this is a five-year plan, so you should expect five years of reports that allow us to share the impact that the plan has had. And that will be shared in May 2024 with the community. We are going to go over just a couple of the actions that have taken place since last spring, including some evidence of impact. Next slide, please. The first thing we did to address coherence within our district, as well as the equity-centered capacity building, was to engage in professional learning for our district leaders. This was a mandatory professional learning. We were able to support 300 central office leaders and they presented, they participated in five work sessions last spring and that continued to this year where they are once again are able to participate in three sessions this fall. Before participating in the first event, the first session last year, all participants took a skills test and that skills test was used to identify what are the areas that we need to focus our energy. The yellow bar illustrates the results prior to the sessions. So you will see that 43% of our leaders felt that they did not have the skills needed to identify policies and practices that led to racial um, disparities. You will also see that 46% felt that they were able to identify policies and practices, but not lead others or have the skills to hold those people accountable. This data showed us exactly where we needed to focus our efforts and training. This fall, the same participants took another skills test. You will see that now 72% of participants felt that they had the skills to identify. This is great progress, but we still have work to do as you can see, as we support as, as we're leading others. School-based leaders participated in a similar professional development, and that learning targeted specific work around the work in schools. They attended 12 hours of professional learning last year, 
and this year focused on the cross-domain recommendations. The Leader Professional Learning is a part of a more comprehensive system-wide plan. This fall, school leaders attended um, with other members of their leadership team, so they did not come in isolation. Additionally, on October 9th, we had our first district-wide professional development day, which focused on our equity-centered capacity building. The two topics that we focused on were the equity, equitable teaching and learning framework, as well as supports for school and classroom environment. The professional learning was held for all 10-month MCEA members and included over 14,000 participants. We are scheduled to have our second district-wide professional learning date in April. Next slide. That was an actual test, like yes. a t skills based Who developed it? Just quickly. The district-wide professional learning team in conjunction with the um, yeah. equity unit. We'd love to see that. Absolutely. That yep. Test and take it. <laughs> yeah, you. I mean, and that, yeah. and I think it was, I, I gotta say, I took it. Um, I thought I knew everything that I thought I needed to know as a leader, and I did not. Yeah. Um, so it was really eye-opening and humbling, I think, for, for those of us that, you know, are engaging in this work, but also really educational to say, okay, this, this gives us a, ben, a, bench line, a bench, benchmark of where we need to start. So they, they wrote the test or they were the ones who were responsible for selecting what resources, to, what resource to use as a test? So collectively our teams developed the test. Based Shared on it. research. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Based on research, it wasn't I'm yes. just picking up that other right. course, yeah. And administer the test, then use that data to determine needs for professional learning. And it's a skills based test, right? So like they are asked to look at a policy, sure. right? And be able to pick out of the policy. They are asked to do performance based tasks um, in a, in alignment with the rubric to determine their level of skill. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry to distract you, but thank you. No. A couple people asked. Yep. So in addition to the skill development, the professional learning also included learning on how to use anti-racist and culturally responsive tools and structures so that all staff and leaders are expected to utilize those in our day-to-day -day actions. This is how we work to build that coherence and get better results. So you will see, for example, whenever a new program or initiative is getting started, all leaders and staff must use the process on the left that takes teams to an activity that will help them uncover the root cause of the issue. All leaders have also been trained on a family engagement planning tool. This year, schools will use this tool to reimagine what back to school nights could look like for the first time in decades. In addition to the professional learning, the Equity Initiatives Unit, we revised our service delivery model to ensure that we were able to increase the amount as well as the intensity of direct support to schools. This targeted level of support was designed to help schools develop anti-racist practices that connect directly to their school improvement plans. This year alone, my unit has worked with over 150 schools with over 800 touches to those schools. And now I'll turn it back over to Sharon. So, oh, where did the, oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't realize there was transitions in there. I'm sorry, Essie. Um, okay, so I'm just going to, I'm gonna close this up by, before we go to questions, with just talking about some of the other actions. We really wanted to spend some significant time on thinking about the professional learning um, that we're engaging in, because as you saw at the start of the presentation, they're saying equity center capacity building, coherence, they have identified that we're fragmented as a system, that we're not all operating from the same lens. So part of that is engaging in that, in that work. And that's what, what's so challenging about the equity center capacity building is that everyone's coming at it with a different level of understanding and knowledge, and you gotta be able to appeal to everybody and bring them up all at the same time. So that's, it's challenging. Um, but so far, it's been a very rewarding experience. Some of the other initiatives, um, or I shouldn't say initiatives, but I should say actions that we have taken to really focus on those cross-domain recommendations. Again, we're trying to work on the system level first, right? That's where we're gonna get the most bang for our buck in really creating sustainable change. 
First, we designed the Pathway to College Career and Community Readiness that was launched um, last spring to our staff and early this year to our community. We heard loud and clear through the anti-racist audit having those structures of accountability, and we also heard from our community loud and clear that was referenced repeatedly in the audit, we don't even know how you're defining success. We, are, like, we don't understand it. The pathway is designed to be able to create that transparency for them. This is what you, you need to be looking at with your child. Now we're getting into the real tough stages of that path, of rolling out that pathway, because it's one thing to roll out a tool, it's another thing to try to create that understanding, the resources, the connections to schools, um, so that everybody is able to be served through that work. So we're still working on that. There's a whole second component of the pathway to college career and community readiness, which is pretty innovative as far as other accountability structures that we've seen out there that involve competencies that we're saying all students should have by the time they leave 12th grade. What we're designing right now and we're doing it in collaboration with our stakeholders is what are the experiences we want to double down on for our students that it doesn't matter what school, what zip code you're in, um, what demographic you are, that you're going to have an MCPS in an equitable manner, K through 12. Um, we know there's a lot of variance right now in how students experience certain things, whether it's an extracurricular activity, even outdoor education that's been around for 60 years. So we're trying to create an, an equalizer or an equity tool embedded in there by stating these are the experiences all kids have. That's going to be part of the pathway. That part of the pathway is being launched publicly in February. We also worked on creating both internal and external dashboards. We heard loud and clear around being accountable for that racial equity work. Well, first thing to, to do when you want to be held accountable for something is you need to understand what it is and what it looks like for you. So um, we designed internal dashboards first, which were launched in August to all of our staff with an intentional focus on our, on our um, school-based leaders and central office leaders that take all those pathway uh, milestones and provide them drilled down data by school by demographic um, so that they can see progress in their own populations and it's a quick visual and then that accompanies our performance matters tool which also allows our internal staff to dig in deeper and engage in active action planning around the work now we recognize that that's great for internal staff but what about our external community right we have heard frequently from folks that they want to see the progress, we've heard it from County Council as well, in an easy to understandable and a digestible format of how our district and how our students are doing. We're launching on December 5th next week uh, when we present to the school board on the annual report our external data dashboards that will be live, and I'm calling it a soft launch because it's, it's our first phase, other phases, where a, the community is going to be able to go in they're going to be able to click on whatever school they want or take a look at the district as a whole. And they're going to be able to see those pathway measures and how individual schools are performing. They're going to be able to see individual enrollment data, the demographic of their staff that at their particular school, um, a breakdown of programs that exist in their school. And even we're building in features for data to be downloadable for our community to be able to see and analyze. This is going to be phase one. We're going to be building on this throughout the year and making it more and more interactive. Again, when we start launching these things externally, that allows our external partners to hold us accountable as well for our racial equity work. Additionally, um, and Dr. Alston mentioned this as well, we have reimagined the school improvement planning process. And it is now much more focused on race and equity. Every school um, is, is required, was required over the summer to do a data story with a focus on identifying the levels of racism that exist in their schools and their community with an intentional focus on our black, Hispanic, EML students, special education students, and students um, who are receiving farms services as well. So that reimagined school improvement planning process has just been launched. And what I will say is that we have work to do with that. It's not a perfect process yet. We, are, we, we just designed a new, a new plan and process. We're in the process of continuing to engage and working with the schools that have variance in how they developed their goals. But we are working side by side with school leaders in providing them the professional learning that they need. Additionally, and I think this is the last one as I'm looking up there, 
um, is the Remind app. I don't know how many of you have been made aware of that, but something that came out of the, um, the anti-racist audit too was we need better communication and easy ways to communicate, especially two-way communication with our community that is culturally responsive and in multiple languages. We launched the Remind 101 app. Schools are still currently being trained, will be done with training in December. It has already been an extreme, the feedback we're getting on it is fantastic. I can text you in English, you can text back in whatever language you'd like, it automatically translates, and it allows the, the best part about it is the community has to download nothing. We don't have, you don't have to do anything. If you have a phone, you can receive the messages. So this is another tool that we're using to transform the way that we're engaging our community. So as I conclude, I do wanna say again, that when we think about the work that we're doing, when we think about all of this, we constantly are getting questions around, well, what's the budgetary impact? What's the budgetary, where's the line item? And I want to stress that this is comprehensive, methodical, and involves the transformation of how we're doing our work in every space of the organization. So we currently have investments through ESSER um, that were provided to you in advance of this presentation that we're using largely to kickstart some of our work around equity center capacity building as well as coaching um, skills to really bring that coherence around equity centered capacity building. We've also used some money for our dashboarding um, in that and also an opportunity to really expand our study circles program, which is an opportunity to really start engaging in these conversations that impact our community the most. So. We are not there yet. We have not arrived. Um, this is an ever-evolving work in progress. We are excited to share our initial phase, and we are going to be excited to share our end-of-year report. And we also want to make sure that we're emphasizing that it is, it is a constant work in progress. We will make changes. We will have to make adjustments. We will try things that maybe don't work. We were told by the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium that conducted the anti-racist audit after when we were doing the action plan and, and, and consulting with them still, as we said, Dr. Olson and I said, okay, so who are some districts that we can like get in with that are doing this work that we can like really just collaborate on our struggles with? And their response was no one. They didn't know anybody that was tackling this to the degree that we were. And the people are addressing portions, but not in the same way. So in, in some aspects, we're building the plane as we're flying it. Um, and we're going to use that feedback from our community, from our stakeholders to make sure that we're making improvements along the way. I'll turn it over to Council Member Jawando. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the, the presentation and the framing, uh, and I think it will provide good opportunity for our colleagues to ask questions. I'll ask a few, and I'll I'll hold myself back because I could ask the whole I could be here the whole night with you, and and I'll turn to my colleagues on the committee, and then I'll turn to colleagues uh, um, that have joined us from uh, that aren't on the committee. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned the uniqueness of this effort, in that. You know, we're trying to basically confront a, a system of education that's been developed over hundreds of years in this country. Uh, you know, I sit next to Council Member Katz over there. We're, we're the two bookends at the end uh, when we're in full council, and he often tells the story as when he started MCPS, he, it was segregated. He was in segregated schools, and he sits next to me. And when I started MCPS, they were still segregated, but in a, in a de facto versus de jure, and how that process uh, has impacted both of our lives, right? Um, and so it's it's big challenge, but I so I appreciate this framing, and I'm glad we have this slide up there. The pathways document when it first came out, I was I was like I've seen this before, and I remembered when we when uh, we were in the when I was in the Obama administration, we launched My Brother's Keeper. It had six milestones uh, for boys and young men of color, and there was similar girls, young men, women and girls of color program. And they were pretty similar to this. It was like, are you getting access to early childhood education? Can you read at a third grade level by third grade when you switch from learning to read to reading to learn? Uh, there are a couple difference. Can you avoid interactions with criminal justice system? Right, obviously impacts. Um, but are you on track to graduate? Can you, et cetera, are you, ready to, are you college and career ready? So these are really important markers that will indicate the success for our students. We know we have serious challenges in a lot of these markers. We just had a committee session a few weeks ago on third grade reading scores for black and Latino students, which in the, in the case of Latino students were in the single digits. 
uh, in, in our black students were low double digits, 14%, I think 7%, something like that. Um, and so we have significant challenges. Um, so I think we're measuring the right thing, but here to, you, to your point of how we're going to get it done, dashboard is a great idea. And I'm glad the community can will be able to look at that and will be able to look at it starting December 5th. What is the plan for ongoing community engagement uh, throughout this five year and, and on process? You know, you mentioned you got a lot of community stakeholders engagement at the beginning. How are you going to continue that? What is the process? Because we've heard a lot from a lot. A lot of people are invested in this and they want it to succeed in the community. How are we going to make sure throughout the process you're hearing from them, getting feedback, adjusting as we're building the plane? Mm -hmm. What are those mechanisms? Absolutely. So there are a couple of things. First, if you go on the website, you'll see the live tracking document so that the community members are able to see exactly where are we with our progress. So as you look at the action plan, it outlines each specific action step, progress towards that goal. So that's one way. Second way is that we also have the superintendent's advisory committee. And so on that committee, we have members from some of the representation of those that have been identified on that previous slide, but other organizations as well that support in providing us with feedback as well as the superintendent so we can keep the community informed as they bring some of these things back to their community stakeholders, but that it's a two-way communication piece, right? It's not just us giving information, it's an opportunity for them to also give us information, things that we need to think about so that we can advise the superintendent in making decisions. So those are the two major ways that we have right now. Also utilizing, as mentioned, Remind app, as we update things and things become available so that we're able to inform the community. So maybe you didn't attend the board meeting, maybe you didn't have an opportunity to watch it or you didn't read the press release. We're able to send that out so that parents and community members are able to be aware of that as well. Okay, well, I appreciate that, but you know, that's inadequate in my view. Um, this is a comprehensive 200 page systems wide approach. Um, you did a lot of good inputs on the front end. You know, I participated in some of that. But we have to build into this process ways for community members who are experiencing this, parents, teachers, uh, other school professionals, students themselves. And, and the, the, I, as I love the people on the superintendent's advisory group, but that's not going to be enough. Um, and so I would encourage you to build in other ways uh, throughout this process to get feedback. It's just going to be critical. Absolutely. And I, one other um, item that I do want to mention is that in January we are launching our staff, student, and com staff, student, and community uh, surveys, uh, climate and culture surveys, which will provide us a lot of feedback on a lot of the work that we're doing because we do have specific questions designed around the equity inclusion and the work that we're doing with the right. anti-racist audit. So we can ho we hopefully, um, if we deploy well, we can get a lot of really robust feedback about what's working and what's not. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And if we, I encourage you to think of other ways and let's be in conversation about that. I'll ask one more question and then turn to my colleagues. You mentioned you, you jump-started some of the training and professional development. You know, we know the challenges we, we have in our system. You're taking a systems-wide approach, but the system is made up primarily of people, and people are implementing the system, right? And, and the structures are super important, but how people operate within the structures, for example, the example you gave us of the test of self-awareness that people are taking, right? And, you, and you've put some money into training. How are we going to sustain that budgetarily um, because you know we have a system we're, look we're on the end of age we're on the tip of the spear and that's always our problem right we're trying to figure it out but do we have the resources and how are you thinking about making budget recommendations I know you don't decide the budget but to make sure that that ongoing training uh, and improvement process is will be able to continue past this ESSER money I think that's a twofold quest uh, twofold answer of our current thinking one, we know that, and I'm going to use a, an edge of speak term, but then I'll explain it. Um, that macro level professional learning where you, sit in, where you sit in a room and you get an opportunity to hear and get trained on specific things. We're doing a lot of macro level right now, right? We're specifically using our ESSER funds to provide training for leaders to be engaging in ongoing coaching around the equity and the anti-racism work that we're doing. That's really where all professional development says that's really when you want to create change, you need to make sure that that's happening on the micro level. So we're currently providing training on how to do that and engage in the coaching, and we're going to train the staff 
to be able to do that and deliver that. We have 26 LASs currently that are being um, going through a rigorous, going to be going through a rigorous training LAS. program. I'm so sorry, okay. another as you speak, learning and achievement specialists. Yeah. Um, they work directly with schools on their school improvement planning work, and they're going to be trained on how to coach around the equity work. All of our principal supervisors, also called directors, are being specifically trained on how to work with the schools and the principals around this work. So we do have an, a department for district-wide professional learning, <clears throat> excuse me, that is going to continue to provide both that macro and micro, which is that job embedded training. But the idea here is, is that we are training people to be able to engage in the coaching around this work. And I think as we go and we see what's been effective and what hasn't, that's where we'll have to make decisions as do we need more training? Do we need different types of people doing the training? All of those questions are going to have to come up. Right. So I appreciate that. So train the trainer and then assess and then adjust. Um, thank you. I'll pause for now. I'll put myself back in the queue. I'll start with uh, Council Member Alvinas. Uh, thanks. There's so much to unpack, and I know there's been a lot of work done, and I appreciate the community engagement. And there are a number of organizations, the Black and Brown Coalition, the Black Coalition for Excellence in Education, and many others that have been doing their own analysis and their own studies um, with a series of recommendations, some of which um, is reflected in what you all have been able to derive as well. But um, there's just a lot of good work going on right now in this really critical moment in time. And Councilmember Jawando alluded to the reading scores, which are terrifying. Um, and if you pull the thread on those scores, this is a generational impact, the likes of which I'm not sure our country will be able to recover from if we don't get this right. And obviously the institutional racism is underlying and contributing and expanding the challenges that we're all facing. But I really appreciate MCPS stepping forward uh, acknowledging we have a problem and, and doing what you can to try and fix it. Um, I also appreciate Councilmember Jawando mentioning that, you know, we, we're talking about systems changes, um, which can sound sometimes bureaucratic because systems are made up of human beings and of people. And so my first series of questions are going to be on sort of the personnel front um, because I know MCPS is intentional in its hiring practices in trying to recruit faculty and staff that reflect the diversities of the communities that we are trying to serve. And it has conclusively been shown that when you learn from people who understand your lived experience because they've lived it themselves, then you're going to do better. Um, that's true in healthcare, um, and that's true in so many other spaces. So can you talk a little bit about what we're doing and what strategies we're utilizing as part of this plan to expand upon the existing practices of MCPS to recruit staff that reflects the diversities of the communities we're serving, particularly black and brown. So, can we start? You go okay. ahead, you start. Okay. So um, um, in the action plan, domain two is dedicated solely to workforce diversity. So in there you will see uh, increased partnerships with our HBCUs, uh, different colleges that have specific programs that generate um, teachers of color, right? Whether it be Hispanic teachers of color, indigenous teachers of color, just looking at what are colleges, not just locally, but outside of Maryland. In addition to that, you will also see in that plan um, increasing the minority, the number of minority um, teachers that are nationally board certified. <coughs> Research has shown that the ability to be reflective in the practice of a national board certified teacher. And so that's also a step that's in there. So we've looked at not just where we're going, Right, but who we're hiring, who we're putting in front of our teachers, or, excuse me, our, our principals when they're asking for additional hires because they have a vacancy to ensure that those applicants are reflective of the demographics of the school. So we've also done begun having professional learning um, with that portion, our, our hires, our managers uh, in HR so that they are also aware aware of their implicit bias as it comes to hiring, um, so they can begin to mitigate that, as well as how to intentionally support uh, our building level administrators in hiring those. So looking at trend data, the past five years you've had 15 vacancies. Of those 15 vacancies, you've hired two persons of color. Let's have conversations about that. So being explicit in that as well as ways that we've been working to address that. And just to add to what uh, Dr. Alston said as well, and I know 
because we are just putting this together for the strategic plan report or the annual report that's coming out next week. I mean, HR has more than triple. I think it was. I think it's triple. Don't quote me on that. So I look back at the numbers. The number of recruitment events that they attended last year that really focused on recruiting um, diverse candidates. Mm -hmm. And as Dr. Alston also also stated, and I, I can't reiterate enough, it doesn't stop at the recruitment process, but retaining. Our, our, our uh, teachers of color because their experience is often reported to us as being very different when they get here and a lack of support has been communicated. So HR has been working very hard on figuring out what are the strategic mentoring programs, retainment opportunities, coaching and support that, are, that our um, staff of color may need that is unique based on their experiences that they have when they're in MCPS. If we could expand on that, because you, you jumped ahead to the second part of my question, um, and I appreciate you anticipating it. So, because it's, you know, our black and brown teachers and faculty and staff that will be the best recruiters, um, because if they talk about their experiences in a manner that's which positive, it's just common sense that they'll encourage the people in their networks to apply um, for these positions themselves. So, how far along are we in the development of the program that you just described? and how much more can we anticipate in its development before the end of this school year? I don't know if we have, if our HR person's here or not, so I'm looking around the room to see if she has come. She's not here. Okay, so our, our resident expert, I can't really answer all those questions, but we can follow up with you to get you more information on that. That'd be great, I appreciate it. Um, and then just, not just black and brown faculty and staff, but all faculty and staff obviously need to embrace in their own DNA, in their own, because, you know, just as, as they're onboarded, as they're hired, um, what are we doing in the questions that we ask, in the interview questions that are asked, um, in the reflection of the people who are on the panel that decide who gets hired? Like, how are we focusing on making sure that all of those aspects are addressed as well? So also in domain two, areas that we've identified as priority areas are how do we want to support professional learning for those who are hiring but also evaluating, right? How do we examine our PAR process when it comes time, performance and review process to determine if a teacher is being granted tenure? So looking at what is the professional learning that's needed for them as well, that also has expanded to our onboarding process. So as you look at our new employee orientation, how have we made shifts in that? That's something that we've also identified. So that there is one professional learning for um, not just the new employees, but those who support them, whether it be their consulting teachers, their administrators, uh, that, that core team, so that they're aware of their biases, they're aware of the supports that are needed, so that we're intentional. Again, it's not about uh, solely about the ability to recruit, it's the ability to retain, right? And so we've been asking the question, what are we doing to keep and why do people leave? And so once we are able to identify that, we can then figure out how do we best support so we can keep so that it's not just about retention, about, excuse me, recruitment, but we're actually focused on the retention piece as well. And I just thought of something to, to, to add, add to add to it that I know that there is work underway on is really helping to create some affinity groups mm -hmm. um, for staff who have the similar uh, similar racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, and experiences. Um, we have heard loud and clear from our staff. We have done them through our equity initiatives unit. Um, and how unbelievably beneficial it is to our staff to be able to engage in, in affinity conversations to help just as a, as a, as a level of support and learning. Um, so that is something that we have built into our professional learning and uh, support of our staff as well. I appreciate that, and of course it's true in every profession, um, you know, on the council like that. I've got my own support network um, that, that is critical to me, um, and I know my colleagues feel the same way. My final question for now, and then I'm going to get back in the queue, Chair Jawando. Um, and you mentioned, Ms. Sharon, the enrollment data. Um, one of the issues that we're having, and again, I chair the Health and Human Services Committee, and this is very true in uh, the health space, is the manner in which we aggregate um, ethnic data is based on census tracts, which do not reflect the full story. Um, so Hispanic, Latino, you know, does that mean first, second generation? Does that mean second generation? You know, which country of origin are you coming from? Um, the same is true in our black community. That does not completely tell the story, and it certainly does not tell the story in our Asian community. 
So are we looking at, because I know we are in HHS, within MCPS moving forward, better desegregating the data and tracking the data in a way that tells a more complete story than the one that's being told now? I appreciate that question. Um, that is not, this is not the first time we have heard um, that interest. So we follow what the federal guidelines are around that. There is currently legislation from my, from my understanding, because I know our Department of Shared Accountability is following it mm -hmm. very closely, to expand what the current groups are. Mm -hmm. And we will make sure that we are in alignment with that um, for reporting. So we're following that along, that along very, very carefully, because we do want to be in alignment with that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it comes up a lot and, you know, we have such a diverse community. There's so many subcategories within each and they have different outcomes and uh, it, it, it become challenging. But thank you for, I'm glad you raised that. Uh, Council Member Mink. Thank you. Um, I first wanted to, to follow up on a, a great question that Councilmember Albernos just asked uh, around the staffing and recruitment piece. Uh, what it sounds like you're doing a lot of the right things to go into the you know we want to tap into the right pipelines. Um, but you mentioned correctly that retention is also a huge issue, um, and um, you know as you've heard, staff of color have a very different experience, uh, and that's frankly true in many workplaces, and um, so it's it's critical to be digging into that, absolutely. Um, as you were talking about that, you mentioned that you wanted to find out like what other supports our staff of color might, might need. Um, and I just wanted to note that it's not just what else our staff of color might need, it's, it's what additional training do others need, right? What accountability measures, like what are the safe, trusted mechanisms for making complaints and suggestions, including anonymously, and being assured that there is going to be follow-up. There has to be uh, a willingness to put the burden on those who are not the impacted people, um, and you know, an awareness that for some folks that's going to cause some discomfort, but that's going to have to happen in order for forward progress to be made, and, and we'll get there. And we can't obviously default to the status quo of having that uh, discomfort land on our black and brown staff uh, and other marginalized folks who, are, who, who we know are dealing with that right now. Um, and this kind of plays into you know, questions that we had uh, a, a few months back, obviously, as we think about you know, that we need, the, we need reform, obviously, in our reporting mechanisms and our follow-up mechanisms. We need to build trust also amongst our staff as well as our, our students and the public about those mechanisms. Uh, and so I just wondered if you had any thinking about how those pieces fit together. Well, I couldn't agree more with what, everything that you just said. Um, we do have our HR start. expert who just popped in the room, so she's going to be able to come forward. But before I, I turn it over to Miss um, Key, who is our chief of OHRD, I do want to respond to some of what you said, because yeah. you couldn't be more correct. We hear time and time again, and we know that oftentimes our staff, even students, and communities of color are shouldering the burden for the work and how unbelievably exhausting it is to experience the trauma of racism and then also be held, be held accountable for having to educate everybody else about what it looks like. It's exhausting and it's traumatic. So that I couldn't agree more with, that we have to make sure that people have the knowledge and understanding and self-reflection to be able to truly understand and dig deep. Because what, who is the majority of our workforce? You probably know. White women, right? As a white woman, woman myself, it is my responsibility to make sure that I am caring and holding this work even though I am not a person of color. Because it is just as important to me and the outcome for my white male child that I have who goes to Montgomery County Public Schools, that every single child that walks into, in, into, the, into the school system is supported and feels valued, safe, and heard as it does for anybody else. So it is incumbent upon us to make sure that we create that environment that our white staff is, uh, is doing that as well. But let me also be clear, it, that makes people feel uncomfortable. It does. It makes people feel uncomfortable, but we have to stand as a system to be able to say, you might be feeling uncomfortable about this, but this is the right work. And it's the right work because no child in our system deserves to have an experience where they are not getting everything that they need. So while we don't have all of the answers to how to make all of that happen, it is incumbent upon us to constantly gauge 
engage ourselves in a process of reflection to make sure that we're self-checking ourselves and how we're doing that with others. And, and just, and, and then we can turn to you. Yes, yes thank you, just And just to say, um, that that reflection, we have to make sure that that is part of the system yes. and that there's public accountability mm -hmm. uh, because without that pressure, we can have all of the good intentions, um, but it's very difficult to ensure the follow through. So, um, you know, just just whatever the, the those mechanisms are, are going to be. I mean, we have uh, obviously there's the metric of how are we doing on the retention of our of our uh, teachers of color. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? And like when we look at teachers who are leaving, what do those numbers look like? I mean, I know that I've left workplaces where you know it was many of many women of color who left in the same year, and the next year like nobody it was like nothing happened. You know, so. Uh, there has to be a, a, a stopgap where if that happens, we're going to notice that because, you know, the Board of Ed is expecting a presentation, for example, on at what rates are different groups leaving the system, at what rates are they, are they staying, um, and then requiring some kind of, uh, you know, follow-up on that so we can be continually making improvements. Absolutely. That accountability is key. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> Hi. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is April Key, I'm the Chief of the Office of Human Resources and Development. You had a question? Yeah. So, I mean, as we're thinking about this, part of part of the the um, part of the system that we have to have in place is ensuring that we are improving our system of uh, receiving and responding to complaints and accountability, uh, the suggestions that folks might have. Uh, clearly, we know that that system was has been very very flawed for many years. So we have to improve that system. We're going to be getting feedback from uh, the OIG's office that's going to help with that. But I know that MCPS is already working on some things. And then there's also going to be a, a trust building process. Uh, uh, people need to see it working. So, uh, and that's going to be necessary for improving our retention. So, could you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Thanks. We, um, I've been here since June, and we have had a lot of experiences um, that have challenged the community's ability to trust our processes. So, we take that very seriously and have engaged in our communities of practice where we are listening to staff, community experts, community members around our process for promoting and how we can make it transparent and completely fair. And we are able to clearly articulate the process that our applicants go through. We understand that the building of trust will take time, but I'm here for a long time, and I'm willing to do that work, looking to partner with the community to get that work done, because I do believe that there was a time when we were a school district destination of choice, and I want us to get back to being just that. Thanks. I'm sure that we'll be following up in more detail yes. uh, about all of those questions. Last uh, question: um, Could you speak to the timeline? Uh, it looks like we've missed a number of the projected dates, and so if you could just speak to why that is, how it's being adjusted, um, especially looking, you know, concerned about some of the community engagement pieces uh, for the reasons that Chair Jawando mentioned. But if you could just speak to the timeline issues. Absolutely, and so. One of the things that we recognize is being an anti-racist organization, we have to be reflective in our actions. And so sometimes we say that we're gonna do something by a particular time, and as we begin to do it, we realize it's a lot more complicated than we thought. We farly underestimated what this task was and what the lift is. And so we've tried to be as transparent as possible in regards to, yep, we're, we're behind on this one, this is where we are with this, this is what we're doing, but still be very clear about this is our intent and in getting it done. Um, so what we've recognized is that some things are a larger lift than we anticipated them being um, and just being transparent and, and moving towards that way. Thank you. I mean, I, I do certainly appreciate that you've made it really easy for us to see where you're not meeting the timelines and that's uh, that's important. So that's a good step. I would be helpful and I don't want you to rush stuff either. We want this to be done well. If there was a way to indicate on here, you know, when we're when you're really behind, uh, like, you know, that you, you're adding something to the process or, you know, this has branched out into this or that something that shows that it, you're not behind on this because it's not important. And so you stopped doing it, but rather the opposite. Thanks. Really good point. And I think Thank the, dash you. the dashboard will be important there, too. 
Um, so just for my colleagues, I'm going to turn to uh, Council Member Lukey and then Council Member Friedson. Um, no, I'm actually I'm going to turn to Council Member. Okay, is that okay? All right. And I want to try to transition us to the second item, uh, you know, just after three o'clock. So, you know, so Council Member Lukey. I'm not going to take 22 minutes. I promise. I promise. Um, thank you for your presentation and thank you for all your work. Um, and thank you for pointing out that you said the remind tool, which I love, by the way, um, is not necessarily uniformly being utilized because that was that was one of my questions because even within our individual school, um, so I have three children in high school, so I get a lot of remind and other notices, but um, that we were getting them from some teachers, but not all. So. Is it only certain teachers in certain schools, or is it being rolled out in just certain buildings? That's a great question. So it's mandatorily, the training for um, Remind has been, is mandatory for all of the administrator and front office staff, right? So okay. that they can utilize that. The use of Remind for teachers currently is optional. We are working with our association partners um, in order to talk about the transi this transition. Right. And right now, it's optional for teachers. What our goal is, also that came out of the audit, um, as well as a lot of other community feedback, is if you give us one more platform <laughs> that we have to navigate, right. we're right. going to go through a roof. And, that, right. and that, that's, that's, not just, uh, that's not just the um, community. That's the teachers and the staff it's who everybody. are having to do yeah, that. Yeah, it's all the many people. <laughs> so prior to making anything mandatory, because we know that there's a lot of tools out yeah. there, yeah. this was an opportunity to get everybody's feet wet with it, experiment with it. And our goal is because Remind can do so many other things mm -hmm. that we actually are going to pull back on some of our other communication tools right. and replace it with Remind Thank so that you. we're using <laughs> one. But we didn't want to mandate teachers. We have an agreement with the teachers union that mm -hmm. anytime we offer, we do new technology, we, we work with them, we talk to mm -hmm. them about it. So this is, and we, and we were loud and clear to the schools, it is optional for teachers. And, I, and my child's in sixth grade. So I have some of his teachers, I'm getting a remind notif notification all the time. Others I haven't heard of, and that's appropriate because right, okay. right now it's optional. Gotcha, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, I wouldn't get anything for the sixth grader, and I know it's not right. because there doesn't need to be a reminder, right. so. Right. Um, uh, so um, in the variations and the results that you saw from the, from the audit, because they, you know, they did vary widely depending on parts of the county, different factors, right? And, and so when I, when I dug into all of that, um, it made me think not only are you assessing where there are big gaps and huge challenges, but can you see from that the places where something's going well, where there was more balance and there was less extreme response and find out and delve deeper into what's working in that building that's working for those students and how to replicate it in those where there are bigger gaps where we need to do a lot more work. Excellent question, and I don't want to put this person on the spot, so I will not call them up here, but I did see them in the room earlier, but I am going to call them out. They can wave. They will wave. <laughs> and that is James Ulrich, who's over there um, with Argyle Middle School. I will say, um, first of all, every single school got their own individual um, anti-racist right. audit reports, responses right. from their families, right? And there were shining, shining um, data that you would look at the data mm -hmm. and be like, wow, like there is some really positive response. Um, Mr. Ulrich is one of those principals at Argyle Middle School where we saw some of that. So I want, I want to be clear that we don't only look at what is happening with the anti-racist audit from a deficit perspective, right? Gotcha. There is a lot of really fantastic work that is happening on the ground level at our schools every single day in service to students and staff. So a lot of the work that we need to continue to do, and I will acknowledge need to do better as a system, is elevating some of that great work that's happening to see how we are using that as a model as an, and an example to replicate across the system. And then um, to Council, Council Member Albernaz's point about data and disaggregation of data, mm -hmm. because I, like I respect and understand that the U.S. Department of Ed gets certain reporting from the state. You all have to report to the state, and you have certain things you need to send to them. Mm -hmm. But, but knowing that, knowing what the categories are that MSDE requires in its reporting that each local school system has to do, can't you still, because you could roll up to the MSDE mandated categories, even if you disaggregate here locally for the dashboards that you would be sharing 
publicly and understanding I know you have to suppress certain cell sizes and all the all the good things right nothing under 10 um, but couldn't we still do that locally because given the diversity of the school system and given the sheer size of the school system that's incredibly valuable data analytics for for you all and for us as policymakers I know we don't make policy for the school system, but to Council Member Albernaz's point about HHS and its view and the way it's looking at it, well, it does dovetail with some of the things we do in HHS, and it would be useful to inform that work as well. So would that be something that the school system could consider doing? I definitely think we can go back and look at it. I do think it's important to note that currently we pull all of our data dashboard um, information that we are, we are sharing, it, it is a complex process to change because it, it involves changing our student information system, right? Gotcha. Which involves how, how students enroll into the system, mm -hmm. what they mark, and that's a massive overhaul. That is not a quick and easy fix, okay. but it is definitely not something that we should um, ignore or not right. continue right. to explore. And that's going to be the beauty of the data dashboards, and I do want to uh, emphasize that we're really trying to take an anti-racist approach to the data dashboards in that what we're going to be sharing on December 5th we actually have a big opportunity and, and a button on the dashboard. Please give us feedback. What are you not seeing? What do you need to see better? And that would be an example of something that we are going to be collecting and then constantly improving upon the process, to be clear. And then my final question, for the data story that you talked about where the schools would develop, the administration would develop their data story to figure out you know, what do we need to do and how should we go about doing it? Is that, I mean, obviously it's something they, they work on directly, but do you all help guide them, reflect, provide feedback, tell them where they need course correction, where maybe the self-reflection was, needed some objective input perhaps, right? Is that yeah. something that you all are doing? Yeah, that is an excellent question. So especially when we're, when we're revising an entire school improvement planning process, right. Right. We, we provided uh, copious amounts of professional learning along the way two principal teams, those LASs I mentioned, the Learning and Achievement Specialists, um, they are all assigned a cluster of schools. They work directly and give feedback, as do the principal supervisors. And when all along the way, as they're building their data mm -hmm. story and they're working directly with their leadership teams, and then even when they submitted their school improvement plans, right, there was, it was actually quite a, a, a sight to see in our auditorium where we had a ton of staff, all 210 school improvement plans where they were digging through them with a rubric gotcha providing specific feedback and you know some of them they were great and some of them we just needed to we need to work a little bit more i mean that's part of just trying to get people who are coming at this from all different places right. on the same page right awesome thank you so much thank you councilman lukey um and i just want to acknowledge uh board member lynn harris is here thank you from the school board thank you for joining us a frequent participant in at the education and culture committee uh council member friesen Thank you very much. First of all, thanks for all the work. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you to colleagues for some really good questions. I'll try not to repeat uh, too many of them. I had some similar, uh, some I want to build upon. Um, the first thought I want to build upon is I, I will absolutely echo the point about engagement. It is not good enough to just have a, a dashboard. Uh, that's that's uh, talking to, not engaging with community stakeholders. So um, that is not adequate. And so I appreciate uh, colleagues saying that, starting with the chair and uh, reiterated by others. I just want to, you know, kind of double tap, triple, quadruple, quintuple tap that because none of this works, none of this matters, none of this makes any bit of difference if there isn't adequate level of engagement and follow through. And that's only going to happen if it's a constant cycle. And I appreciate that in the report, it talks about how there's no end product here that this is an ongoing iterative process, but in order for it to be an ongoing iterative process, there have to be inputs, and the inputs have to come uh, from um, uh, from the, the stakeholders, uh, which, I, which I think is important. Did you want to share something? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You've got to hit your button. Thank you. I'm Laverne Kimball, and I'm the Acting Chief in the Office of School Support and Wellbeing, and I'd like to speak um, for a moment relative to some of the engagement that we do with the school improvement plan. Um, clearly, we recognize that engagement has to be an ongoing process. Um, even as recent as last night, I'd like to share an experience that one of our principals had at um, Potomac Elementary School in terms of bringing in 
um, some of her parents, um, black parents there at the school. Um, earlier, Ms. Sharon referenced um, the importance of affinity groups. And uh, Ms. Holly Hill, the principal, brought in parents, and they were so delighted to be there as she spoke with them about the anti-racist plan and um, in terms of the actions that the school had relative to their school improvement plan. And she took suggestions from them, of course, right on the spot. And so um, just as my colleague shared earlier, it really is an ongoing process. Um, these school improvement plans, this is truly novel, groundbreaking work. You know they say that you're not supposed to um, praise yourself, but as a member of Montgomery County Public Schools, I have to say that I am awfully proud of the work because this really is groundbreaking. Um, as we look at some other schools, we have, in terms of engaging students, I know as we did the um, work with the school improvement plan um, at one school, the um, principal brought in 30 students and she shared with them then some of the voice data that they had collected and also asked for other suggestions then in terms of what are things that we can do to make this a better experience for you. And of course, that's what we talked about. That's what we know in the audit in terms of how people experience things um, very differently. So clearly in our schools, as we look at that work, we recognize that there is so much to do and there has to be ongoing engagement. And I know we have had um, parents then who have said, you know, I have not um, been involved in uh, this process at my school. And absolutely, we're, we're not there yet in terms of all of the processes being as culturally responsive as we want them to be. However, that is definitely um, the road that we're on. It is a journey. We are working on that. And we know without that level of engagement that we're not going to get there. Um, in the Watkins Mill cluster, in terms of looking at back to school night and how it is that we reimagine that, um, it was just awesome to have so many parents and members of the community out and just doing things in a very unique and novel way. And we have two of our wonderful associates in the audience, if they would like to add any more color to um, what I'm sharing. Um, the point that I want to make is that we recognize that engagement is important. We need the voice data. We are not, we recognize that we are not going to be able to become that anti-racist system we want to become without having that ongoing uh, engagement. And just as the uh, ed um, education um, chair shared at the outset, when we look at racism, we know then that here we are, we're being challenged to have this educational um, echo. We're working within an educational ecosystem, but we know that with regards to race, as we're charged with um, coming up with an anti-racist plan, and gladly being charged to do so, that we're working within a racist country, county, state, all the way around. So clearly, the engagement is critically important. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just uh, a lot of questions and concerns have been raised about the role of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-LGBTQ hate, anti-Asian, AAP, uh, a, 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 uh, PI uh, hate as well. Uh, could you just speak to that and, and, and the role that that has? Because I, I think there's been a lot of conversation about that. And I just want to make sure it's addressed. Thank you for that. So in domain one, one of the areas that we've addressed is how do we respond to hate? How do we support schools? And so in there you see that we've outlined the use of study circles 
as a tool to support and engage in some of those conversations. If you look at the work as a district overall, one of the three components that we have in looking at our response to hate and bias is first looking at how do we do that prevention piece. So that's the educational piece. So how are we supporting with professional learning to our staff members, to our students, so they better understand. That second piece, looking at the whole piece of communication and reporting. What is our communication process and how do we report? When an incident occurs, um, I receive those notifications. I deploy them to the specialist that's assigned to that school so they can reach out to figure out what supports are needed. We do that support in conjunction with other units within the organization, such as restorative practice, such as uh, Office of Wellbeing and Support. The last piece is how are we being responsive to those needs? We recognize the fact that, um, well, we cannot have a cookie cutter response because this is a nuanced action. Right? And so we have to ensure that the responses are specifically tailored to meet the specific needs of that respective school. And so it could be that we're going into support with learning, it could be that we're going into support with response, but making sure that we're specifically looking at what is the specific action and how specifically do we need to respond to it so that it's not a cookie cutter, everyone gets the same thing, but it's truly tailored to meet those responses and those needs. So those are some of the pieces that we have both district-wide um, as well as looking at specifically for schools. In addition, we have um, identified and revamped this year how do we respond to situations as a district so that there's a clear flow chart to ensure that we are reporting correctly, that we're assuring that um, we are communicating who's bringing, being brought into the loop so that as it becomes time to communicate that the voices are being heard as we're crafting those messages. How are we responding, making sure that everyone who needs to be in that space is in the space. And just to add one critical component of this, and I believe you all heard about this yesterday, if, if my memory serves me correctly, but um, the Stronger Connections grant, um, the entirety of, not entirety, but the entirety of one portion of focus of that is to specifically think about the proactive uh, response to uh, hate bias incidences holistically, as well as um, you know the reactive responses and a, and a campaign to really educate our community around some of this. So that work that just recently got approved is going to be ongoing. And the focus of that grant also, and I think it's very it's very important to understand, is not just about racism, but is about all forms of hate bias. I appreciate that. I think it's really important to communicate that and communicate it proactively because I do think there. Are, Understandably, are a lot of concerns, and there's a question about cultural competency and dealing with some of these issues, both on the proactive side of things, which is critical, and then the reactive. I know we'll get to that in the second uh, portion. I'll just—I have a lot of other questions. I know others do. I'll just have, ask one one more, if that's okay with the chair. Um, a couple of principles were highlighted here: Argyle uh, Potomac Elementary School. We have some great principles and some incredible people who do extraordinary work on a daily basis. Uh, my concern, however, has been uh, at times it feels to me in addressing some of these challenges that are happening in schools, particularly related to hate bias incidents uh, and the underlying institutional and structural challenges that don't start in schools, don't end in schools, unfortunately, but uh, really are exacerbated oftentimes uh, in schools, that we're, we're putting a lot on the principles. And it doesn't always feel like, to me, they're getting the level of central office support that they need to be successful. Uh, and it's also not clear to me how we are bringing to scale the things that are working. Uh, you know, that the, the, the challenges are significant. Uh, we're highlighting one-off great things that are happening, which is terrific. And I think we should celebrate those incredible uh, wins. But one of the challenges is, um, are we then taking that example of something that worked at Argyle or worked at Potomac Elementary School or you know, has worked somewhere else and said, okay, let's, let's institutionalize this to, to every other school. Let's give other principals the, the benefit of this. And in most other industries, you know, there's a library of best practices. There's you know, some, some ability, uh, it's empty. There's, uh, there's, there's some ability to, to have that information sharing. And I know that our administrators are dealing with so much, our teachers and educators are dealing with so much on a daily basis, the idea of adding another aspect of understanding what others are doing while they're just trying to manage uh, you know, their overwhelmed workload as it is, is challenging. But could you just speak a little bit uh, to that? Because I think it's a, it's a very big concern that I have of whether or not you know, we're not only 
operationalizing the uh, elimination of the things that aren't working as part of this work, but we're also institutionalizing the things that are working and expanding them in a more significant way. Thank you for that question, and I think um, you bring up a, a great point, and I can't remember the exact words that you used. I tried to write them down, and then I didn't get them, but you, you talked about expectations. So as we are, we are engaging in systemic change, one of the first things that we need to do when you're trying to create that coherence that you mentioned across the system is create common and clear expectations for all, right? So you talked about a repository. We have recently, um, when we were dealing with some of the anti-Semitism and other hate bias incidences, we created a bank of resources that all schools received, right? That's one example, right? Of, of, of how do you deal with this? How do you engage in conversations with your, with your, with your community around this? The issue that you see with variants isn't always about the fact that central office didn't provide resources. It's about there's a variability, in, and this is not a blame on anybody, but there is a variability in comfort level, skill set, different community needs, different issues that, that schools are dealing with that is then incumbent upon us to then strategically support. So for instance, we provided a lot of resources out there on how you can do X, Y, Z. But one of the things that we have done when we're talking about hate bias, which I think is what you're referencing in particular is, we get as exec executive leaders and Dr. Alston, we get, a, we get the reports, right, of hate bias incidences that, they, that are in schools. We don't just leave the schools to flounder on that. One of the things that Dr. Alston's office does, um, there are specialists in his office that are assigned, they are, they are assigned a load of schools, right, that they are in, in charge of. Every single time a hate bias incident comes, no matter what the hate bias incident is, what grade level it is, there's immediate contact made with the principal to say, what supports do you need? Are you good? Do you need us to come out? You know, how do you think your community is responding? Do you need help writing a letter? Like, what, what is that level of support that you need? Right? Some principals are like, look, I got this. Like, I've done this, this is, this is old hat for me. Others maybe are brand new and they've never had to navigate this before. So it's incumbent upon us to not just say, here you go, but then provide that targeted support along the way. And that's what we do collaboratively with the school's office. Yeah, I think it's important. I just want to note, and I think the Community uh, Connections grant you spoke to is a more proactive approach to yeah. this. Most of the response up to this point is reactive, which we're going to get to in the second portion. It's very, very important because the way that we handle hate bias incidents really matters. Yes. It not only matters to those who've been traumatized, it also matters to setting the tone for the entire culture of the community of how we respond to these incidents yes. and how we value people and how we devalue the use of hate in the way in which we, we, we treat one another. So it's very, very important. Yes. But the broader cultural dynamics and the, the training, the proactive piece of this, that the anti-racist audit is really focused on, the, the systems-based change, that's where I'd like to see further work and also further communication on how that is being handled you know, across you know, hate bias, but not necessarily exclusively reacting to the individual incidents. I think both areas need work, but I think I have, my experience has been every time we talk about the broader nature of hate bias we talk about how we respond to the individual incidents, which needs work, and we're going to talk about that next. But uh, we need to make sure that we're talking about it, you know, in a, in a systemic, proactive way, because that's really going to address the root cause issue of these, you know, terrible dynamics. To make sure that every young person in our schools, and every educator, and every staff member, and every visitor feels safe and feels valued and feels heard. So. Uh, appreciate that. So th thank you for that. I want to be respectful of colleagues and time, so I'm going to yield back. There's, mm, sorry. There's Matt, Go ahead. Also, Go ahead quickly. Yeah. There's also a Canvas page that's been set up for staff. So we have the PLCs. They're able to participate and share best practices so that it's not, again, isolated and that we're not sharing those best practices. Also, at the next upcoming um, administration and supervision meeting, we have it so that it's set up as someone to an ed camp where principals are able to, schools are able to highlight the, the things that they're doing that are working, right? So that other schools can come and hear um, about some of the best practices that they've incorporated, how they stood those up in their building, right? So that they can then share and provide feedback, insight as to how that's working and how they created it. So we are looking at how do we support schools and hearing from other schools in regards to some of those best practices that you just mentioned. Thank you. 
I heard the word principal and I sprung to my feet uh -huh. <laughs> working with schools. Um, actually, my colleagues shared um, some of what I was thinking, but in addition to that, when you were talking about um, just how do we scale up these practices, I th believe, uh, Mr. Fritz, and you were in our meeting this morning when we were talking about that very topic and just really looking at it in terms of all of our practices as we address this very challenging work, how do we do that? And so we are creating the resource banks. And so I will uh, give you an example. Um, an issue that we were talking about earlier, this isn't the, the anti-hate the, um, anti work. Um, but for instance, as we talked about reimagining back to school night, then we have a back to school night toolkit. We have a back to school night best practices. We have a back to school night video that our staff in um, school and um, family engagement have developed because we want individuals to be able to see these best practices. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, we've talked about uh, just as some of the practices that, I've, that I shared earlier um, with school improvement planning processes and what have you, that uh, in terms of, of doing videos and having principals to share those things at meetings, Additionally, I know that as we plan training in the upcoming um, meeting for principals in um, February, principals will be sharing, um, have an opportunity to present on some of the uh, issues that they are addressing, and they will be sharing best practices at that time. So we definitely believe in building on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Councilman Friesen. Um, I'm going to just turn to, uh, we're going to move shortly. I think there's a couple more questions from colleagues, uh, and then I'll, I'll say something at the end. Uh, Council Member Alvernas. Uh, not a question for this panel. It's actually a question for the board, and I don't want to put Lynn on the spot. So this will follow up and, and send this question, and our office will send this question to writing. But So I've been around a long time, and initiatives come and go. Programs come and go. Um, efforts come and go and they get really hot and then they get really cold. So, and I appreciate that what we're talking about here is not just an individual line item, although clearly there will be budget implications in the recommendations, but we're talking about just a culture systemic shift. And when the 19th council passed in law, the racial equity law, um, it was codified. And so I'd be curious as to, from the board's perspective, what tools or mechanisms they have from a policy perspective to ensure that this work will continue through future boards, future superintendents, future councils, and what, if anything, the board needs from us to advocate for at the state level to ensure that that's the case. So um, we'll follow up on that, but that's the question we'll pose. I saw a thumbs up from Board Member Harris there too. So, um, Council Member Mink. Thank you. Yeah, uh, one of the four observations in the school culture category of the audit is students, family members, and teachers report that school staff treat students and family members of color differently in the form of harsher discipline and biased attitudes. Um, and we see this in data also, right? Our Office of Legislative Oversight just completed a very comprehensive report titled Addressing Racial Inequity in the School to Prison Pipeline. Uh, and that gives four research-based recommendations conveniently uh, for doing that. But each of those recommendations, which are for the council, start with encourage MCPS too. Um, so I wanted to know how addressing these issues fit into, uh, well, where does that, where is that in the plan here? Uh, and also, are you all using those recommendations? And I'm happy to read them for you if you'd like. Thank you for that. So yes, we are. And so um, we have identified the schools that have the, have the greatest disproportionality in regards to out-of-school suspensions, right? And we have provided for them uh, additional professional learning, not just for the principal, but for all the administrative team and the core team. Can't just be for the principal because we recognize that it's not just the principal who's suspending, right? We find the majority of these schools are our secondary schools. Also, what you could note is that um, as we've looked at the data, we've assigned additional support to schools from the previous year who showed levels of disproportionality. So that could be an additional social worker, it could be an RJ specialist that's assigned to support that school as well. And so we found that where we've added those resources, we've seen a decline in disproportionality. Um, 
but for those where we're still struggling with the disproportionality. Um, there are scheduled, I believe there are five professional learnings. There was actually one that occurred today um, that was for those schools that can provide them with additional tools, resources, supports, professional learning, strategies, and also unpacking the code of conduct to recognize um, suspension isn't the only means of discipline. Also looking to see as we're looking, um, how are we looking at those offenses by race, by first offense? Right, and so um, Andrew committed a behavior that's the exact same behavior that Will committed for the first offense, but yet they had different consequences and they go to the same school and have very, the same very administrator. Very common, actually, by the way. They have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't live in Montgomery County, but I could tell from the look, right? Um, but helping them explore and examine that as well, because a lot of it also is bringing awareness, right? Are, are you aware of what your data looks like and why it looks that way? What's going on in them? What are the additional resources and supports that are needed? So it's not just the onus cannot just be on schools. It also has to be the, as, as, as a system. What are we doing to support the schools that we're noticing that these disparities and disproportionalities are occurring? And I do just want to uh, bring us back as well to that constant analysis of self that is so unbelievably important we don't really think about it a lot of times but we have to analyze our own bias and that's hard to do sometimes and that process is ongoing and that's why that coaching component that we talked about is so critical. Can I just pause you just because we have limited time. Yep. I, I appreciate that. But also wanted to make sure that we dig into the specifics a little bit of some of the tools. For example, um, restorative justice that we're going to be talking about in just a moment. Um, we're getting some really great data back already. There's also room for improvement in various areas. Like, where does that fit in on the action plan here? Like, would that fall under? I mean, are, are you thinking about those things together? Um, there's also well, go ahead. Restorative justice is definitely part of the anti-racist action plan. Let me just be clear. Um, that is part of the anti-racist mm -hmm. action plan. I'm it opened up to the page nine in the action plan where it talks about uh, specifically around data collection analysis, monitoring to dismantle structures, policies, practices, and ways of being in order to ensure the elimination of racial dispar disparities within all aspects of school culture, including, but not limited to, academics, discipline and attendance racial justice uh, in the program when you take a look at our detailed action plan is a part of the of the main strategy that they're using to do that work thank you thank you very much good to get that on the record um really appreciate that we could talk about this all day we will have you back to talk about implementation uh and we have been digging into various components of this right we did attendance and truancy uh, we looked at reading and, and math scores. We talked about discipline, the school to prison plan. We had a session on that. So we're going to continue to do those individual components as well to dig deeper. But I, th I think it's important to come back often to look at this high level. And uh, I really just I want to end by before we transition by saying thank you to the school system uh, and to the, the staff and to the board for prioritizing this. Um, you know, there are we as is mentioned, we operate in a system and society that was founded on racism. It was fueled and created by racism. And you have to be okay with that to undo it. And you have to, like you said, be uncomfortable and take these tests and, and then reevaluate and then look at it. And then, you know, and, and that's hard work. And uh, I, I want all of our systems and structures to do that in all of our county agencies to do that. And that's why we passed the law. Um, but I think you all are at, at the tip of the spear, and it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be perfect. We talked about ways to improve today, uh, but I'm glad glad we're doing it. Um, and and that's how you that's how you're actively anti-racist, you know. And it's going to take that work. So thank you. Um, we are going to transition now to our second item. And so folks that are here for uh, the work around restorative justice, please come on down. And I know we have a presentation, Mr. Monsignor, and I'm told it's 20 minutes. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> Got it. Perfect. Perfect. Seventy-five seconds per slide. Remember that when you're on each slide. Exactly. Exactly. We have our first Saturday. Many of us are going to school meetings to support the events. 
do have our days in front of us. I know you do. No, I know you do. We just want, we're eager to get to the questions. And we have the aforementioned uh, Principal Ulrich here, as well with others. So why don't we first just get this out of the way and everyone introduce themselves. Yeah, come on, slide down. I think we have one more. Okay. So, Mr. Mazzoli, why don't you introduce yourself and have your team introduce yourself and then uh, go right in. Sure, it's, it's good to see everybody again. Uh, Damon Monteleone, Associate Superintendent in the Office of School Support and Wellbeing. Good afternoon. Shauna K. Jornby, the Director of Student Engagement, Behavioral Health. Good afternoon, James Arch, Principal at Argonne Middle School. Thank you for all the shout outs. <laughs> good afternoon, Kevin Yates, Principal at Damascus High School. Hi, good to see everyone. Stephanie Dinga, Principal at Cabin Branch Elementary School. The brand new school. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Uh, staff, anything to add before we jump in? Okay. Go ahead and jump right in. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to start us off here. So once again, uh, greetings, council members. Um, like everybody who comes before you, and as I said uh, just the other day, we, we really appreciate the opportunity to engage in this dialogue about the critical work that we're doing uh, around restorative approaches for our students. Um, as has been mentioned, engaging the community is key and having consistent touch points with community advocacy groups has been and is now and will continue to be part of our work. So in that vein, I'd like to acknowledge Racial Justice Now, Young People for Progress, uh, Jews United for Ju uh, Justice, the uh, Black Coalition for Excellence and the Black and Brown Coalition, who I believe are here in the audience and have been integral partners in not just the anti-racism work, but the work around restorative justice. Um, and so as we begin this conversation, it's important to note uh, Maryland Code 7-306, uh, which states that the primary purpose of any disciplinary measure is re uh, rehabilitative, restorative, and educational. So MCPS, much like many of our, ca our counterparts across the state, we've been charged with implementing this. So it's not really a question of yes or no, it's a question of to what degree uh, and how authentic we are in our work. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not only providing uh, pr proactive, uh, proactive measures in our schools, but ensuring that we are able to repair the harm that has been caused when incidents do occur. Next slide, please. So while the pandemic has interrupted, um, did interrupt some of our work, it also really accelerated the need for the work. And I think that's well documented. Um, many people in the community, and I, I believe we've heard some references uh, just today, believe that restorative work is something that only happens after an incident. Something happens, there's a fight, there's an incident, send in the RJ team. Recently, over the last year and a half, many people have linked RJ as the sole response to incidents of hate bias. Again, that is, uh, I believe, a misconception by some who may not be uh, as close to the details of the implementation of the work as well as the data associated with where the work actually is. Um, and so the foundational work of restorative approaches is, is to foster a uh, positive community um, and really about self-care for, for, your, for yourself and then care for others. And in fact, only 7% of the work that our RJ specialists do in schools, 7% is for in response to incidents. That's it. So the overwhelming lion's share of this work uh, 51.5% uh, uh, of, the, of the, the time of our specialists were in schools was spent, this is the 22-23 school year data, on consultation and professional development, 10% for mindfulness, 23% for individual student and teacher support, 3% for parent and community engagement. So I think I really want to make sure that we're operating with, with a set of facts as we move uh, forward here. So next slide, please. So what does restorative justice look like in our schools? So joining us today um, are several dynamic school leaders who are tackling this complex issue and implementing restorative approaches within their schools. So as has been stated several times, Principal, Principal Ulrich is the 2023 Maryland School Principal of the Year. He has been featured in publications across the country for his efforts in changing student outcomes through restorative approaches. So today we will hear from Principal Ulrich. We will also hear from Principal Yates and Principal Digna of, of Cabin Branch. And um, also I believe Acting Principal Dr. Booms is in the audience, as well as several of our RJ specialists and coaches. Uh, next slide. 
I believe it's on you. It's on me. Uh, so first of all, that, that picture that was on the cover there is uh, always makes me laugh because my wife was, saw the picture and said, did you just pull those kids? And I said, actually, they were walking in the halls and they were supposed to be in class. So I said, come on in. Let's actually have a conversation. And then somebody was able to snap a picture. And then we were able to make that happen. Um, you know, restorative justice is one of those things I'm really, really passionate about. Um, not because it was my idea. Um, but actually because in my building it came from teachers who were, were looking at, when I first got to Argyle, the high number of referrals. And they were saying to me, like, what, what's going on? What, what do we need to do differently here? Um, so we started to address that issue by really looking at community circles. We created an advisory. And what we saw is that our teachers and our students did not have a relationship. They didn't know each other. Um, and what that meant is when students were upset in a particular classroom um, and instead of engaging the kid to figure out what was going on, they were actually triggering the student. And that would end in the student being sent to the office, which sometimes ended in that student being suspended or disciplined in some other way. And what we found is that we needed to change that. So I'm passionate about it because as my teachers were coming to me and talking to me about what, at the time, I'd heard of restorative justice. I saw that something needed to change. I said, let's go ahead and give it a try. Um, and it has been the proof in the pudding. It has worked time and time again. What we have found and, and we've, we've come to find is that it's not something that is the catch-all. We don't use that for all the responses. Um, oftentimes, it is done in conjunction with um, not too long ago, we had uh, a student um, who had a, a pretty major issue that we had to send home. Um, and part of him coming back earlier, so he was suspended for three days, and part of that student coming back earlier was a need to come to the table um, to have a restorative conversation because he disrupted and harmed a school community disrupted in this particular case the cafeteria and we needed to have a conversation with the cafeteria manager and things of that nature. Um, parents were involved, um, the student did end up coming back earlier and it ended up working out extremely well. In that particular case we had a balance of a suspension that could have been three days into being one day and a restorative conversation. The staff member that was involved in this particular incident walked away feeling whole again. So often we get caught in thinking that restorative justice is about making it easier for the student who has maybe done something inappropriate. It's also about teaching them, teaching them that some of the actions that you take actually harm people and you need to understand what that harm is. And then you also need to be able to repair that harm and repairing that harm is part of how we bring you back into the community. So a lot of this work that we do day in and day out is about keeping our kids connected. We want our students to be able to come to school and feel secure and feel that they have a place in our particular building and that requires us to know who they are. That also requires that when they make mistakes or when they do inappropriate things that they have a path back. And oftentimes that's what restorative justice is and that's what it's all about. So in the article that you saw, I really focused that, that time and that article around using restorative justice to build community. Again, not focusing on the student who did something inappropriate, but focusing on how do we actually build community. Sometimes it's in those conflicts that we actually get to know that student, get to know their family. And through that, we're able to support that family in a way that we haven't seen before. We didn't even know existed. We're bringing parents to the table with a student and they're able to share things and then we're able to then provide a different type of support. That is through the vehicle of uh, restorative justice. So leadership matters in this work. Um, we have to model it as principals and administrators within our building. We model it. Teachers sometimes have concerns about something I said or did we sit in circle. I have to let them know that, hey, if I did something wrong, I want to be able to talk it through. Um, the support matters that we've seen from the district 
Um, and MCPS wasn't always a restorative justice school district. Um, and I, I think it was um, Mr. Fearson who talked earlier about taking an example in one particular school and then how do we make this system wide? Um, and I was really excited to see where MCPS really take that on a couple years ago when they said, okay, it's not just about what's happening at one school, but how do we make this um, so it benefits all students? So we started to see that. So the support in our particular building um, showed up as uh, this year we just got a social worker part-time, right, that works with our restorative justice coordinator. Our restorative justice coordinator actually existed uh, years ago, actually before we actually had the restorative justice coach position, because we used our alternative one uh, staffing to actually do that restorative work. Alternative one is generally the position where our teachers, uh, our particular teachers working with students who are having challenges, staying engaged, staying within the building, doing all types of things. And what we found is that the restorative work was actually bringing them back into community, bringing them back into connection. So um, we appreciate being here, appreciate being able to talk about this, and I can go on and on and on. Um, but the work- You're eating into Mr. Montaloni's <laughs> so. but, 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 but the work is real, and, and it works, and it's not a catch-all, and it's not easy, and it requires some convincing, it requires a lot of communication with parents, a lot of connection with our, with our students, with our staff. Um, and when I first got there, I remember having to have a, a student saying, hey, I want to have a restorative conversation with a teacher because they felt hurt by what a teacher said. And I remember that teacher saying to me, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not having a conversation, like, I'm, no. Like that was the early, that was the early years of it, right? And having to build the capacity, knowing that we need to build the capacity of, of our staff. Now, students, teachers are asking to have restorative conversations with, with students who maybe have done something in the classroom. We just see it all around. Yeah. And it's something that I know constantly warms my heart because it's really about building the community and our building. So that way we can really get to what we're here for, which is the learning, the instruction, the education, and the connection. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Aldrich. Principal uh, good afternoon. I have a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come pass that around. Oh, you're serious? <laughs> oh, okay. 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 <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk through every slide there, but these slides are for you to uh, kind of get a, a better idea of, of what's happening at Damascus High School in terms of RJ. Um, our, our work started with our analysis of the anti-racist audit, so that was a perfect segue earlier. Uh, and we also conducted student voice data. Every administrator at Damascus, we have principal and three assistant principals, we each uh, had a student focus group uh, last, last year. Ms. Dinga was part of that because she was a visiting principal while I was a visiting principal at Glen Allen. Um, and we, we pulled these students, we, we asked them specific questions from the anti-racist audit. And what we found is that as the anti-racist audit pointed out, our African-American students at Damascus High School feel less comfortable and less sure that teachers see them as capable. In addition, we had a disproportionate number of suspensions for African-American male students who had individualized education plans, otherwise known as special ed students. It must be said, we had a very low number of suspensions in, in, in you know, comparing to other high schools. However, when you looked at those suspensions, it was there was disproportionality. As a result, we at Damascus have focused on restorative justice, trauma-informed instruction, and unconditional positive regard in every classroom. Our administrative team tracks every single major offense that happens in a Google Sheet. And that ensures that we're monitoring our consequences and our own implicit bias. So in that Google Sheet, we have the demographic data, the student name, grade level, ethnicity, um, the offense uh, description, the action we took, and then the administrator's name. Um, in addition to that, we uh, built in a process for um, when we are considering a consequence um, and if we are considering a suspension. After consulting the um, student code of conduct, uh, revised student code of conduct, it should be said, um, we consult with our social worker, thank you very much, our resource teacher for special ed, our um, director, and we check our Google Sheet 
to review the consequence for previous incidents that were similar to that, to make sure that we're in line, we're not out of line. Um, the use of the RJ as, re as a restoring the relationship when an incident does occur has been extremely impactful. Um, we have developed many RJ assignments at Damascus, uh, when I say RJ, I mean restorative justice, sorry, uh, which require the students to read and research about a topic uh, in which they have uh, demonstrated a lack of knowledge, for example, the use of the N-word, um, drinking, showing up drunk at a, at a football game, um, you know, disrupting the cafeteria. Um, the student reflects on how their action impacted others. And then as part of that assignment, they're reflecting and they're, they're coming to terms with what they did and how they can return to the community. Um, RJ meetings with students with parent permission has been extremely helpful in restoring relationships. Um, as a result of these steps, the restorative justice, the trauma-informed instruction, the addition of the full-time social worker, and the Bridges to Wellness team, and the implementation of a deliberative process when deciding on consequences, we have reduced our major incidents over the past three years. So 20, let me get my numbers right, 21-22 school year, we had 92 major incidents, not suspensions, just major incidents, 47 major incidents, 22-23, and so far this year we've had 14 major incidents. Out of that, we were able to reduce our suspensions from three years ago, we had 35 suspensions, Last year we had 21, so far this year we have four. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank the council for the support of the social workers in every high school. It's been extremely impactful, thank you. Also, the RJ unit and the RJ specialists who have been instrumental in assisting us in this important work. And now, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Dinga. Thank you, Ms. Dinga, at the brand new cabin. It was great to open school with you earlier this year. Yeah, thank you for being there. I'm going to talk briefly. I, t I was told I had one to two minutes. So I have the babies, um, and right now we have pre-K to fourth grade. But today I'm going to talk about how I was able to be at Goshen Elementary School, which was a, like they said, an original RJ Grant school, and then how I've taken what I learned from Goshen into Cabin Branch. So at Goshen, we had this week-long training with coaches, and it was a discussion around, okay, how are we going to implement this? We're training the leadership team. We can pilot. We can have some that feel comfortable doing it. And for me, it was a sense of urgency. Our kids needed this now. Like, so it was a, no, a non-negotiable. All students are going to get this every single day. So in our SEL time, which is social emotional learning time, it was restorative practices. We did a community circle every morning. Some teams, um, because we had to do academics first thing due to part-time staff, they did it right after recess, because a lot of incidents happen at recess, so kids want to talk anyway. Uh, and then also, after we implemented that, it was about not having students removed from the classroom, like you were discussing. We didn't have referrals. Students weren't sent to the office. We had code calls. Code green was if a student left the classroom. Code purple is if a student is getting violent or throwing um, chairs or desks. Um, code yellow is they're anxious and they need some extra support. So knowing that there was a code in a certain area, our core team arrived and kind of was like, who's the student who has the best relationship with them? They're gonna be the one to intervene. And we were able to help that student in the class so they weren't removed from the classroom. Because my feeling is if a student is removed from the classroom, they no longer feel that they are a part of the community. And that is what helped us not only reduce our referrals, but help our students know they are always a part of the community no matter how they react or how they act in certain atmospheres because they're always loved and taken care of. And it's our job to help them get back to being able to learn. So at Cabin Branch, it was different because I got staff from 60 different schools. And so we dipsticked with our survey of asking did, are they coming from a restorative practice school? Did they get the multiple day training? and just kind of check all that apply. What have you received? What do you need more of? And we differentiated the learning during pre-service. And once again, our schedule ultimately had every day you have the community circle. And it wasn't about a social emotional curriculum, it's the community. This is what we do. And this is how you're going to gain relationships with the students. You need to build and maintain relationships in order for the students to trust you and have them be available to learn each and every day. And that's what we're doing currently at Cabin Branch and it's working um, just like one example. I did a community circle. We had a student in second grade, his mother suddenly died. The grandma called me, let me know that he was gonna be out for the week and said, it's okay to share. 
So I sat with that um, class and we talked about what this means, how does that make you feel for the student, and how are we going to support him when he gets back. And then they were ready for his return so that he had that extra love that he truly needed, in addition to the support he was getting from the staff. Thank you, Principal Dinga. All right, so I'm going to do the impossible. Um, <laughs> wow. You're okay, um, you're okay. Okay, so um, I wanted to share that while we have as a district um, done this work in pieces and parts over the years, right? Whether it's 2014 under Dr. Elizabeth Rathbone introducing certain elements, schools that have piloted certain pieces, uh, the RAND study as uh, Principal Dinga described uh, from 2018 that had 43 study schools to the 2019 HB 725 directive that had us expand across schools. Um, it hasn't always been supported in the way that a large school district with a, over 160,000 kids and 25,000 employees might have needed to be. And we've seen a little bit of change in that in the last year or so, uh, in the last two years, um, in different parts and pieces. So we have currently nine RJ specialists. They're central office staff. They're assigned to a cluster of schools. They're assigned to about 27 schools, and they serve at those schools. In addition to providing PD, mediation, support, modeling, consultation for those schools, they also specifically serve at two middle at a middle school two days a week. So they're like staff on site at eight specific focus schools. And that's connected to climate, it's connected to DISPRO, et cetera. The several of our other schools are served by a social worker. Um, stipended RJ coaches work came from um, an initiative with the council's two groups, RSWAG um, and RSSW. Uh, I never get all the S's right, RSSSW, Reimagining School Security and, and Well-Being. And those introduced for us are secondary schools, high schools and middle, um, coaches that are stipended at $25 an hour. Um, for 240 hours, so it's six thousand dollars that the school can use, split between one or two staff. Elementary schools just received that at three thousand dollars, only 120 hours, just last year. Our RJ coaches are the nine; those are new, just of just as last year. So a lot of this work that's been pushed forward has been done through research grants that might staff two or three specialists, um, and then more recently, ESSER. So I wanted to talk about like the impact and what that impact could be if we could sustain some of the work. We're always fighting for it. Um, request for an RJ specialist to support a school full-time is the top principal request that my office gets, and I can do eight. So every year, we evaluate which eight <laughs> out of 211. Uh, next slide, please. So you said the top request you get from schools is for an RJ specialist. Yes, it is. They want, or they want, if they don't want a central office specialist, they want to use someone in their building, for example, a coach, to be fully More released. Full -time, but it's yeah. it's a it's a yeah. full time position. And their principals, like Principal Alrich, who's creative with his staffing, in terms of shifting, uh, most don't have that luxury or or have that ability. Um, we did ask how are our central folks requested for support. So typically, and I'll say typically because all requests for support are not the same, typically there's an incident that happens in synergy. The admin reviews that incident and determines whether it's teacher referred or admin supported or referred. They examine the code of conduct for what the continuum of responses are. And most responses we encourage, we encourage local responses. We know those that serve the community best are those within the community. That's why we build relationships. Um, and then there might be a request for supports based on a number of factors. So if the incidents extend into a broader community, we support a lot of things that go on within apartment complexes or within groups. Incidents that may extend across schools. So an incident might happen at one high school that involves students at another high school and they require a little bit more coordination. Um, incidents where staff may have a conflict of interest. Our staff um, doesn't only serve in Montgomery County, a lot of us live in Montgomery County. And so sometimes there might be a conflict of interest with a student that might be a family member or how the staff serves with a relative, things like that. Um, and then incidents that might require just additional facilitators. 
This was big. We could handle it locally, but we need more hands on deck to be able to support. And one that's not often discussed, and I'll share this with you today because it's been a conversation with MCC PTA representatives. Um, we get requests directly. We've had 41 direct requests from parents that call our office and say, either we've used you before, or we know somebody who's recommended you guys, or we don't yet have a relationship with the school, and we would really like um, someone that is is a, an outsider to come in and support. So there's lots of different ways that request can be initiated. And I will say, those requests for supports are what I'm talking about in terms of incidents. That doesn't include what uh, uh, Mr. Monteleone mentioned, where most of our work is not that. It's in capacity building. Um, next slide, please. Trauma supports have been a really important part of the work, and we have been um, fortunate to have uh, social workers that are part of our divisions. A lot of people don't make that connection. RJ is in the same department, that is community schools, that is social workers, that is alternative programs. And so those things do work together in some ways. In some ways they don't. Um, we know that everyone is different and trauma is subjective. What is traumatic to me may not be traumatic to you. And so we know that those experiences dis differ. Our clinical social workers, 43 and a supervisor, have added so much to our groups in order to be able to provide trauma-informed care as a part of these processes. There is no RJ specialist that works alone. They work in a team that includes a matching social worker. So when an RJ person presents a lesson, Right? That lesson is also reviewed by a clinician. Often when we do a support that's a larger scale support, there is often a therapeutic counseling support present or offered. Um, it's a constant question that we get. And I wanted to, you to know that our RJ specialists come from a variety of backgrounds. You have nationally certified board counselors. They are special educators um, that have been RITSEs. They are uh, social workers. So our specialists themselves receive additional training. Many are trained in ACEs and are county ACE trainers as well. Many are trained in mediation and are certified mediators. Um, I do want to point out the pre-conference process. I know that Mr. Howard from Odessa Shannon is in the audience today, and they have done a number of circles that require that process. Um, it's where we meet with the families before, the students before, including those who have harmed and those who committed the harm, to even determine whether a formal conference or circle is, is necessary. I think a lot of people believe that that is the automatic response. It is a response in a continuum of responses. Very often, we might recommend individual therapeutic counseling and we don't want you to engage, right? So those responses vary. Um, the ability to have a support person present with prior consent is one that's not often talked about. In an RJ circle, you have the right and the ability to say, I'd like someone with me, or I'd like a process observer. Um, and then directions for follow-up, including identification of supports that may not live in the building. Supports in the building, such as trusted adult, but ones that may live outside or may be connected through our partners, such as Bridge to Wellness or Linkages to Learning. Next slide, please. Simply wanted to say here, these are all headlines, they're actually links to um, the conversation around suspension. And I, I have to be careful here because everything about RJ is not connected to suspension. It's a careful walk. Um, it, the purpose of restorative approaches in our schools is not simply to reduce discipline outcomes. It really is about school culture and climate. However, discipline outcomes is one measure. Um, this conversation exists locally at the state level, nationally, and it's continuous. Next slide, please. So since it's out there, let's talk about it. So I'll start with something simple. What does our data tell us? So in our Synergy Incident Monitoring System, um, and it's not a perfect system, we know that 878 dispositions for RJ occurred last year. Those are just the ones that principals and school leaders input. We know often there, there's some that are not present. 710 students did not repeat the violation, or any violation, to be clear. Not just the same violation, any violation. 168 students did. They did have a repeat of violation. So 
we know that um, often, it is most often a response for fighting, attack on a student, disrespect, and disruption. Beyond those two, uh, bullying and uh, class skipping coming in at five and six. Those, those are codes, correct? Yes, I'm sorry, those are suspension codes. Um, yeah. They're state suspension codes. I apologize. Those numbers. numbers of, those are not numbers oh, of, thank you. of folks. Thank, yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you for clearing <laughs> Sorry. that. Sorry. Yeah. That's, a, the, that's the a good point. They're not codes on the left. They're codes on the right. They're codes on the right. right. The, the, and there's 870. Yeah. Right. We, we sometimes speak codes. in codes, and fighting is is a violation code 405 at the state level. Yeah. Um, so we do know that they have different impact based on those those codes. They have a higher impact on fighting an attack on the student, and that makes sense. If you are conflicted in your relationship or you don't have a relationship, those things are more likely to happen. Um, so it doesn't even surprise me the codes that are, are more likely for RJ to be applied to than not. Um, it is encouraging that 81% of our kids do not repeat an offense. And that really tracks with a multi-tiered system of supports that says a universal support should support about 80% of your students. 20% of your students are always gonna need a higher level of intervention. Next slide, please. All right, I wanna make sure that I get to a little bit of the data because this is important. And it's, it's heartbreaking, but it's also encouraging. So what you are looking at is MCPS's quarter one suspension data disaggregated by race. And the really good news here is that suspensions are down by almost 300 suspensions. And what that means is we have kids that are in school that have a greater opportunity to learn and long term we know that education is the great equalizer. We also have conversations about attendance, which I know you guys spoke about just a few weeks ago. And so there is a, a, a correlating impact on chronic absenteeism as well. So that is lovely. Um, we've been working with principals on alternatives to suspensions, restorative approaches, um, and, and other ways to intervene with student behavior. However, what is not as encouraging is if you look at the highlighted in yellow, while suspension for black and African-American students are down by 75 raw suspensions, when you look at it as a proportion on total suspensions, still accounts for 50% of our suspensions. And what that means is, even when our leaders, even when our teachers, even when we are showing grace and offering alternatives and offering teaching opportunities, they are less likely offered to our students who are black. And that means that restorative justice work has to be aligned with anti-racist work in order to best serve our students. It does not negate that 75 more black children are in school and learning. It does not negate that 300 less suspensions have happened across all of our populations. And I'm really, really proud, especially of our EML populations and our Hispanic populations that have been served by this work but we have to think about this. Next slide, please. I've broken it out for you so that you can see that it doesn't matter. So we know that 73% of our suspensions last year uh, were of students who received free and reduced meals. So I asked myself, right, maybe that's, maybe that's what it is. But if you look, you can see that whether you receive free or reduced meals or not, if you were African American, your number is the only number that has gone up proportionately while the system has shrunk suspensions. If you look at our emergent multilingual learners, suspensions are reduced by more than half. And we are so grateful for that, so proud of that. We are happy for our EML students. Um, if you look at students receiving uh, special education services, um, suspensions are down while we still do work with proportionality. 57% um, of those students are black who have an IEP that have been suspended. Next slide, please. So while we celebrate all of that work, and it's important because all of our kids are all of our kids, we have to continue to recognize the role of implicit bias and racism when it comes to not just our policies, but also our practices. I do wanna say while macro work works, you can see that on the raw number, macro work does work. Whole system, education, all works, but micro work works better. At those eight middle schools that I mentioned that have an RJ specialist for two days a week, 
and the remaining schools that have a social worker, thank you very much for that, in middle school, uh, for two days a week, you can see that suspensions are down. So um, 26 out of our 40 schools are served by one or the other. And in middle school, where we had the highest suspensions last year, we have the biggest decrease by almost 200. So uh, this is one of the limited supports we have in the middle, and it's something that we don't want to take away. Our elementary schools have our community schools. They have uh, linkages to learning. And our elementary schools really do need more support as well. Our high schools have Bridge to Wellness. They have wellness centers, as well as our social workers. Um, the, the middle is a different landscape. And so that's where we've put our efforts. And there's impact there. Next slide, please. Specifically, let's talk about the RJ specialists. We have eight RJ specialists, many of them here in the audience today. They serve at eight schools. At those schools specifically, African American and black suspensions are down by 40%. So while macro work works for everyone, and that's important, micro work works when we are focusing on specific populations. And our OLO report tells us how much that is needed. Our anti-racist system audit has just told us how much that is needed. Observation 1.4 is from the anti-racist system audit that says, some MCPS community members perceive that school staff treat students and family members of color differently in the form of harsher discipline and biased attitudes. And our data bears that out, except here. Next slide, please. So I know when we are uh, talking about implementing any philosophy, any programming, any curriculum, that the focus has got to be on continuous improvement. Um, there are some things that we had to do quickly, right? We talked about um, HB 725. We talked about the sense of urgency. We talked about how the pandemic increased that. Um, but we do have some evaluation measures that are measuring the impact and, and giving us feedback on where we go from here. So there was a large-scale research study, MCPS is unnamed in the study, um, that was done for two years between, uh, I believe, 2019 and 2021. And those results are largely impacted by COVID. So COVID happened right in the middle of the start of the first year. But from that research study, they did have findings that showed that this has positive impact on school climate, I believe mixed impact on, on, on school academics. And they did find that in order to be able to do this work well, school districts, particularly a large school district like us, had to focus on three areas. On building commitment, so our community had to be behind us in this, right? We had to be steadfast in the work. Uh, so building that commitment with our staff and our community, building consistency, we know there's variability. Some schools had the benefit of being a pilot school. Some schools did not, right? So there's variability in, in, in what we know and variability even in our leadership. Uh, so consistency was important. And then building capacity. There always had to be opportunities for learning. And then um, they talked very much about people to do the work. So they talked about staff to support the work. Um, we also had the uh, council groups that included uh, the Student Wellbeing Action Group and Reimagining School Safety and Security and Wellbeing Group, who had similar findings. The similar findings were that uh, mental health um, professionals were needed, RJ needed to be expanded, and we needed to expand the continuum in the Code of Conduct. We did for the first time a district-wide evaluation uh, based on some of the um, standards that had been shared by the state. MSDE shared those for the first time last year. And we were able to do that not just as a district, uh, like many other districts in Maryland did. We did it school by school. We have individual results for each and every school in Montgomery County. And what we found was 90% of our schools had started the work. 20 specific schools had not yet begun that work. And then we've had feedback sessions and community sessions throughout. So our specialists and social workers conduct quarterly listening sessions with community members. 
Um, they recently did sessions with students this summer and parents in the fall. We do have the support of a number of groups that do their own listening session and provide us with the feedback. So as you know, Racial Justice Now had two sessions, uh, the most recent one on November 18th. Um, we know that um, we get feedback from many other groups, I believe, including the ECC, that that do those listening sessions and we hold our own. We compile that data to see what the trends say about where we need to do next. We also know that MCCPTA, um, they do their own sessions and they have a town hall, uh, Clarksburg cluster on December 6th. And then um, the DEI uh, unit in MCCPTA has a town hall on the 7th of December. Um, so we collect data from a number of spaces and share that in order to make improvements. Next slide, please. So for continuous improvement, there's, there's lots that we have to do, right? And it, again, it's a continuous process. OLO and a number of other reports have told us that we've got to continue to engage the community. And we've done some of that. We've began to put together a disproportionate suspension advisory group. It's just at the start. Um, the RJ Peer Group is in its second year of existence. It's a student group that meets monthly. Um, we are continuing the quarterly listening sessions, which actually started out as an action from the anti-racist system audit. We did it once as that action, and then we had so much success with it that we've continued it. Um, we know that we need to share. We know that we need to be honest with our community, with our teachers, uh, with our constituents and our students about what the numbers say. Conversations like we're having today can be difficult, but they're absolutely necessary, and people need to know in order to be able to support the work or to advocate. Um, we know that uh, sharing who's doing what is important. So you'll know that this year on the website, all the coaches are published uh, on the website, including the specialists assigned to what schools. And that's been interesting. I think that's contributed to more parents reaching out directly. Like I said, we've had 41 specific parent requested uh, interventions from us this year. We know that there are questions about consent. That's a very honest thing. And there's a balance, right? So we don't want to create barriers in particular um, for people to be able to receive this service, right? We don't want to create delays in it, but we also know that parents' voice in education is really important. So creating those consents that have become a Google form for formal restorative circles only, not each and every res restorative practice. So we don't need a consent to hold a community circle when we're talking about our goals or our experiences. We don't need a consent for a teacher to pull two children aside who are having a shoving match to have a conversation. But we've committed to a consent for formal processes. For example, if a bullying and harassment report has been filed that is formal, we can respond formally in kind with a consent from parents. And we've in, we included that in multiple languages. And then also a line item at the top for verbal consent, where a coach or a teacher can go in and they can say, I received verbal consent on this day from this person, documented in Synergy in the comm log, as not a barrier to a parent reading another form, completing another form that could delay the process or hinder parents or students from participation. Action planning for our DISPRO schools, which we've talked about before, 15 schools that are identified as focus for disproportionality, 20 schools that are identified for focus for being reactive, and then evaluation. So we found a lot of value in conducting the full-scale evaluation that we did last year, and it actually revealed some areas that cut across schools. Um, one of them is we're starting to become a little bit better about creating frameworks within schools for RJ. Um, and, and, and we're not as good with engaging our parents. We've seen that in, in just about every data point, right? Some of our parents still don't understand what this is. Uh, they see a circle and that's it. They don't see all the other pieces that when the person that came to my school to talk about belonging, that that was RJ. They don't always make the connection. Um, and so we have to continue to work on that. Uh, next slide, please. I think this concludes our presentation. We could really be here all day. We could talk all day. I do encourage you, though, to visit the school sites yourself. If you are interested in how this works and you'd like to come see for yourself, I know that several council members have, have 
done that, that have gone and spoken to partners like Conflict Resolution Centers of Montgomery County, who are dear partners to us, who we have an MOU with. I know, um, Councilmember Juando, you talked last time about Julius West and engaging the coach and the principal specifically at that school about their their um, what they do in their school on a day to day, not related to a single incident. Um, um, and such. So I would encourage that. And now I'll turn it over to you for a discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, we could be here all day, and as yeah. Council Vice President Fried said, we may be here all day, you know. <laughs> but no, we'll, we will go through um, as long as we need to and as long as folks want to stay. Uh, but with the target to hopefully we can be out of here no later than 5 o'clock. But uh, that's the that's the cutoff. If that's, is that okay with everyone on the panel? Okay. Um, I'll start and then I'll turn to committee members and I'll turn to colleagues and then we'll go around and as long as we need to go um, until five. So thank you for this. This is a, this was really helpful. And I'm so glad we have pr the principals here. I think your perspective here is really, really, really helpful. Uh, I, I was telling Councilmember Alvarez, you know, Principal Alvarez and I used to s serve on this thing called the African American Student Achievement Advisory Group, ASAG. Uh, that was created with some people who are no longer with us, Ms. Ruby Rubens and Ms. Odessa Shannon, uh, who has a school named after her, uh, where we sat. I mean, just think about we were sitting in that group 15 years ago with them, and uh, I, I just, uh, it's, we've come a long way, uh, we've come a long way, and uh, unconditional positive regard. I mean, that, to hear you, uh, an MCPS principal say that, it, it's a, it's a, you know, a technique using psychotherapy to just say, you tell me whatever you're going to tell me, and I'm just going to, I'm good, I'm, it's not conditional. You, you can, I'm going to support you no matter what you say. And to have you even understand that concept means a lot. And Principal Dinga talking about our littles, it's really important that we start this as early as possible and we build those relationships. So I'm very heartened to, to hear. I have a couple questions just related to where we are, implementation. Um, to me, it's clear, you know, that this is working where it's in place. It's working at your three schools. Is that a fair representation? You, know, you would agree. Middle, high school, elementary school. Very different, very diverse, different parts of the county, different student demographics. Uh, you're all saying it's working. Um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, two people who are here and who will be available to colleagues for questions. Nicole Garza Diaz, are you still here? Nicole, thank you for coming. She's a restorative justice facilitator and coach at the University of Maryland. Uh, and then Valerie Davis, who's a convener for the Black Coalition uh, for Excellence in Education. So thank you for being here. And I know uh, we had some members from JCRC who were, have been helpful in this work. We're not able to make it today, but I wanted to acknowledge them. Um, implementation. So you mentioned we're in 28 schools, it's working. How do we, how do we get there? What's the plan? And what's it going to cost? And you know, you know, assuming every we're like the, the board agrees this is working, the principals want it. It's your number one request. How it, it's having impact on school climate and reducing suspensions and disproportionality. How do we expand it? I think the first thing is um, just an acknowledgement that we have to be committed to it. Um, I think I, I've been here two years. This is my third year, but. Um, it's it is a fight for it. It's a grant. It's a research. It's it's temporary. Um, I think the first in building commitment is actually committing to it, and that includes all of us. Starting with that, I acknowledge the difficulty of implementing this system wide because it creates variability more so than when we were doing. Uh, I I have two uh, colleagues in in other. Uh, districts in the state that do eight schools, one does 16 schools. Um, and, and those challenges are different. But we've said here that our work is eight, is urgent. We've said here that our anti-racist work needs to be in all of our schools. And so continuing to even fund the, what is here with the coaches, making sure to understand that local matters. Um, as much as I am central office, I know the impact is in our schools, right? And so they do need those supports How with are the, the specialists. People funded. Let's start with that. So they're funded on ESSER. Right. The current, not even. Let's not talk about expansion. The current, what you're doing is funded on ESSER. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, just quick, quickly on the funding. Yes, all but two of the RJ specialists are 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 on ESSER funding, along with the social workers. 
All of them. So that would need to be moved to the base. That's right. So we have submitted that forward uh, for the superintendent's base budget. My understanding is I think it's December 6th. Don't quote me on that date. might be the 7th that the superintendent will be presenting that base budget. Okay, so that is that Great. is very significant. Got it. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's the funding source. There are also professional learning uh, materials and other information and resources that we use through different title grants, but the, the overwhelming lion's share of we're talking about people, that is, that is ESSER. And I know you don't look at the overall budget, but one of the questions in the staff packet was, is there some reduction coming to, to where is that going to come from or is that going to be a plus up? Again, I know maybe above your pay grade, but... Do you, do you yeah, that, that that really would be a, a question for for finance and, and yeah. budget. But the process that we are in at this point in the school district is that, as we have elevated all of our budgets in each of our offices to the budget office, right? They have then ironed all that out, and that superintendent that superintendent's budget proposal is going to reflect those pluses and minuses on the ledger. Got it. Uh, are the Rand study. Uh, the impact findings, can you share that? Yes, so while we are an unnamed school district. To this point, the reason I ask yeah. is because to the point you said about Parenting Gate, like I've seen it up close. Sure. I participate, I think I, I, as I've mentioned before, I've done a circle with my child, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and it worked and, and so I've seen it in the policy side, but I think we need to show others and this, and this is one piece of that. Right, so I think it'll be released soon because as you said, we've gotten the preliminary findings and we've gotten consent to share it with the board and to share it with the council. Um, we were just worried about copyright in terms of posting it on the website. It, it. So when it's published by whichever scientific or social science or educational journal it's published in, I'm happy to share it. But I've requested consent um, to see if that's okay at this point. So we'll, we'll find out within a couple of days. Okay, that's great because it's very rare we get something that you know, that type of study that it's, it's helpful. Um, all the RJ specialists in the room, I know some have left. Can you just raise your hand? Just thank you for being here. I just wanted to acknowledge you as well. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to pause. I'm going to hold back and demonstrate good behavior and pass on to my colleagues on the committee, Councilmember Albert. Thank you all so much. I know it's been a long day. Um, so I'll just jump right in, and, and th this is a follow-up to a, a briefing that we had several months ago, and so I, I know we've made progress since then in a number of key areas. I didn't realize you all partnered with the Conflict Resolution Center. I've worked with them for 20 years, um, and so that's awesome. Um, and we worked together on the development of Excel Beyond the Bell many moons ago, um, and so I, I'm, I'm really excited about the progress. Um, Quick question, though. I think a couple of important headlines here for the general public who may not fully understand what this program is and what it is not, um, is that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, and that, you know, and, and, and also that it doesn't mean that there aren't consequences um, for disruptive behavior, you know. Um, it just means this is another really important tool that administrators have and teachers have and the school community has to address really complex issues um, all the way around. And I think that's an important thing to note. But I do need to ask, though, because it's not a one-size-fits-all, and, and but, but who makes the decision on when it's used and, and how is that decided? I think I mean I think you heard you heard examples of that right so I think t to your point when, when in the early 2000s when it was zero tolerance well that's really easy to apply because that's ob absolute and everybody gets the same there is nuance and so the nuance really does happen at the the school level um, and it, it involves I think there was a good description um, uh, uh, Principal Ulrich described like the process afterwards. Principal Yates described how his team huddles. They look at the code of conduct, right? And in the new revised code of conduct, hate bias is, that is one thing that was spelled out, but also restorative approaches is something that is clear and spelled out as part of the continuum of responses. I was going to just add that, you know, for us oftentimes, you know, we're looking at a particular situation and we'll huddle again with the group and try to look at what is the best way to support the actual situation. Sometimes it does require something, you know, more than restorative justice, but oftentimes it's going to be a part somehow. Because again, for us, it's all about once whatever that consequence is finished, how do we bring that student back into 
the community and, and reconnect them, but also making sure we're, we're repairing that harm. So oftentimes there is elements of it, regardless of what happens. So even if there is a suspension or even if there is you know some type of contract that comes out of it, there's elements of it that we, we participate with. Um, and then the other side of it is sometimes you know we, we, we would ask and we talk with a parent about, hey, we want to have this restorative, and the parent may say no. Right, so then under those circumstances, we may move in a very different direction. Um, so again, it's kind of ebbs and flows depending on you know the parties at play. But the most important thing is that we're getting consent from the student and saying, "Hey, we want you to participate in this." It's not something we're requiring you to do, but it's something that we talk to them about it, and we also help them understand the benefits when they do participate in it. And a technical answer to that is um, most disciplinary decisions at the end of the day are at the discretion yeah. of the principal with right. few exceptions. And those exceptions are really important. K2 suspensions do follow, and MSDE has just sent out a, another recent memo about this to remind us, um, not us MCPS, but State of Maryland. K2 suspensions go through a different process. And so some of our K2 responses require consultation with a psych. Um, and a director. Uh, in addition, some students, for example, if you're a student with an IEP, there are other consults that are required in any kind of uh, behavior intervention or discipline, which might include a consult with a special education supervisor. So at, at the end of the day, most of them live at the school level with few exceptions. Um, for longer term discipline, for example, a, a 10 and E or a 10 day suspension with recommendation for expulsion, it goes through a process which includes due process and moves up to another office, but most will be local at the school. That's really helpful. Just a couple other points um, for now, and then I'll probably get back in the queue. But um, so reduction in suspensions is a key data point, clearly. Uh, and it's something we all want to strive for. But we know that doesn't tell the whole story, right? Um, and so how are we tracking, whether it be through qualitative or quantitative, um, survey analysis of the participants, of the students, survey analysis of administrators and teachers in the school, especially parents? Like, how are we tracking how happy they were or not happy with the program. Thank you for that, because we do know with any intervention at all, you're never going to get it 100%, right? Um, what I will say is there's an evaluation form this year that is paired to the consent form. That is also a Google Doc that people can fill out after a restorative intervention to give feedback about how it worked for them, how was the facilitation, and what they would desire next. Another piece of it, too, is you made a good point about not just suspensions. Um, thinking about the recent culture climate surveys and thinking about also the anti-racist system audit. I don't think it's an accident that um, Ms. Stephanie Sharon called out earlier uh, Mr. Ulrich's school in terms of those positive results. There's, there's not a perfect alignment, but we do see in some spaces that the climate surveys or the, the audit results might match in some spaces, not all, where restoration is being implemented. Um, so that's one way. The other way is through our system surveys that occur with students and staff, um, that gives us some data too about the level of restoration with schools. I also wanna say that when the schools do the evaluations, it's not a one-off, it's not a one person in a room that does it, like how restorative are we? We encourage a team to go out that includes parents and students to evaluate all those elements that are outlined in the standards. Thank you, so it sounds like it's a work in progress, but there are efforts being made, um, I appreciate that. Um, and then how are we handling ESL students? Uh, how are they incorporated intentionally into the model? I love that, thank you for that, um, for our, our EML students. Our EML students, uh, one of the things we were proud about with our hiring for social workers is the sheer diversity of our social workers. That was really intentional. Over a third of our social workers are multilingual, uh, most of them as a second language or as another language or even a primary language are Spanish speakers. And then we also rely on our, our community supports. You mentioned and I mentioned Crickmic earlier. 
as one of those resources. They're in 15 of our schools. We also work in a division in well-being, learning, and achievement that includes our PCCs. There are parent community coordinators and our ETCs, our emergent multilingual therapeutic counselors who are all required to speak other languages and have other cultural proficiencies in order to help us to support. And so wherever we need those supports, these are all offices supervised by Mr. Monteleone, we are um, partnered to be able to call upon each other to add those as line of support. Just if I could briefly on that, I, I was like really happy that you asked that question. This has been very intentional on our part. And I appreciated working with you a couple of years ago as we, as we renovated or upgraded the processes around and the International Missions and Enrollment Office. Um, but those emerging multi-language therapeutic counselors, we call them ETCs, um, they are absolutely involved. They are all bilingual. The Parent Community Coordinator Office that uh, Mr. Amby mentioned is our most linguist linguistically, <laughs> um, I think, uh, advanced group. They speak every, all seven languages in the district. And, and so just to paint a picture, on my team are eight directors, including those who, Ms. Borges and Mr. Davis, who, and when we, we, we triage, we work together to align those, those supports. If you were to visit IE today, part of that entry process is giving information and access to all of this information up front so when people come into our school system, they're aware of these supports. Those ETCs meet with every single family that comes to us from the southern border. Um, and so this is a wraparound from Jump Street on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last is just a comment, and then I am going to get back to the queue with more questions later. But so uh, to my first question, it sounds, and this is understandable, it's somewhat organic um, in how principals are deciding when and the circles are deciding when to initiate. You know, we're getting data in real time, and not every principal is made the same. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. We have three shining examples here, and there are many more in our school system. Um, but there are others who, you know, are, are not as comfortable with, with something like what we're describing right now. And they do need some more specific benchmarks so that it's not as organic. Um, because I think as we learn and evolve, that will be helpful moving forward. I yield back to you, Mr. Chair. Really important point. I'm glad you, you brought that up. Uh, before I lose this thought, I want to mention it for staff. 878 dispositions, that means times that someone just yeah, so, so a disposition it. is the response, yes. right? To a, to something. To an incident. Got it. So the number that would, that Mr. Amby gave earlier, out of however many incidents, right, that could have gotten an RJ response, the 878 number is the number that is the is the number of responses that receive that RJ. That did get it. Yeah. So we can look at that database and we can say we can see which schools are applying RJ as a disposition for which offenses, right, and for which students. And it speaks to what Mr. And, said. Yeah, and then you can see, like, okay, then you can track the student and see if they... Well, that's why I brought it up, because mm -hmm. Councilor Arnold's question made me think about it, that, that that's like who's who's initiating a process and why are they and for what offenses. That's instructive into how we yeah. make it more common to happen. It was analogous to, we, we did a juvenile justice session the other day. There was about 880 juvenile arrests last fiscal year. It was just odd that it was around the same. But to Councilor Alvinaz's point, the key data points from this presentation for me were 81% of that 7878, so 710, did not do something again. And that's in that year, in that school year, one year period, did not have another incident. And then, yeah, in one year, excuse me, and, and that 40% of the uh, African American students you had a reduction of 40 percent in suspensions in those schools those are two at the eight schools that you have this in those are two big numbers uh council member mink thank you um i wonder if we could uh bring up nicole garcia diaz from the university of maryland that would be great thank you i just have to jump in and say i have to leave to go to another meeting it was okay. great thank meeting you, you all thank you so great much day. absolutely thank you for the presentation <laughs> That Google form is incredible, by the way. The, the incident reporting, I was just looking at it in the packet, the, the presentation you give it, the Google form is amazing. Powerful tool. Thank you. Hi, would you please uh, introduce yourself for the record and then if you could give us just a, a very briefly a little about your background uh, with restorative justice work. 
Sure. Hi, my name is Nicole Garcia Diaz. I work at the University of Maryland College Park specifically in residence life as manager for rights and responsibilities. We recently, um, as recent as August, just passed in our code of student conduct to have an alternative resolution process for restorative justice. Um, and that's happening in parallel with us also doing the preventative community building work that has been um, discussed and throughout the community. Been working um, with restorative justice for a few years years now in addition to UC San Diego's graduate certificate program. Great, thank you. Um, okay, a lot of stuff I could ask you, but I'm gonna, uh, I'm curious, you're full, you're full time in restorative justice work for Maryland? Um, so we've seen in the data here today that having access to a full time restorative justice specialist even just two days a week at some of our schools has had a significant impact in the data, uh, especially for our black and African American students. Um, we know that getting a full time specialist is a top principal request. I wondered if you could just uh, speak to that. Why do you think that, that uh, there's such a big difference there. Um, what would you think would be the, the difference in ability for having a, a full-time person versus a, a stipended coach? Did that surprise you at all? Yeah, um, so we also had similar issues in terms of transitioning to that full-time position. Uh, for many, many years, it was just part of other people's roles and it is simply mm -hmm too much for one person when you're thinking about the coordination, having it be trauma informed. Um, and so we had an external review with um, Harvard's Graduate School's uh, Dispute Mediation Clinic and that was one of their biggest re recommendations for us in terms of our um, implementation because so much of that work is not only responding to harm but also community buy-in, education, building trust. Um, it's just simply too much for for one person to be able to do that well. And we know, especially for our black and brown students, when you say restorative justice, if it's not done well, it can actually do more harm than good. So having that um, be done well and thoughtfully can just be so huge. That's interesting that you all saw this, <laughs> went through that same process. Thank you for that. Um, similarly, for, for uh, MCPS, um, around the same topic. Um, we saw, as Chair Juana mentioned, that there are 80% of uh, students in the, um, who went through the restorative justice process uh, didn't repeat the behavior. I wondered if we could get uh, comparative data, maybe looking at years past for similar violations for students who've been through suspensions. Well, we can try. I think what's tricky, I like to be transparent up front, yeah, is great. that data has only been tracked for two years in Synergy. So it didn't mm. used to be a category. Like we, we were not able to measure it years ago. It didn't show up as an independent category. And so we'll do the best that we can. I think good. if I could, I think it's what we, if, if we could really pause for a second and think about this, right? 2019, that, that, H, that house bill comes out of Annapolis. March of 2020, we all know what happened. We come back into schools the fall of 21. Remember Omicron, remember how, <laughs> all the work we did with HHS and the contact tracing and everything that, that, that happened in 21, 22, it was still disjointed. Um, and it wasn't until last year, last school year, 22, 23, that we had a full, not nine, RJ specialists, right? So, so it really is step by step, and, and we are learning along the way. And I think some of the things that have been noted, such as the the, the consent form or the uh, the evaluation after you engage in it, we heard from our community on these points, right? And we are adaptive, and then we move forward. So I think, like with respect, with respect to um, with respect to your question about the data. Making sure that we could track the disposition of RJ as it's associated with an incident was critical for us. And for Ms. Sharon, who I don't believe is still with us in the audience, I'm not sure, but her office was great in, in building this serious incident dashboard that allows us to correlate that. Yeah, data, I mean, the data is incredibly right? powerful. And I mean, I'm, I'm confident that we would see a clear difference if we were, had a comparative data set. Um, if there's some way to, to pull something that would allow us, I mean, I'm sure we could look at like nationwide trends or whatever, but if there was something local that would be great. Um, to uh, go back to the eight schools who are getting that, the, the, those full-time specialists two days a week, um, you mentioned that uh, in middle schools with the highest suspension rates, they had the biggest decrease. Is that the same 
school is that those eight schools yeah they're they're eight middle schools and we could have done a lot more but we had to prioritize mm -hmm. and so they're based on more than one factor but dispro is probably the biggest factor there's uh some climate elements there might be how the some some um um, Can you just define dispro because you've said yeah, it. I I'm know so what it sorry. is, but I don't think people know. Disproportionate suspensions and and disproportionate suspensions are um, uh, measured by the state in a different way than in the county, but it is where you have uh, students with a two x ratio. So for our African American students with IEPs, their populations that are suspended are greater than two times all other populations combined. So it's, that's not even an easy measure to get to. Um, so if you have 20 students that are suspended in every other racial or ethnic category, and I want to make sure I do this right, and 40 students who are suspended who are black, then you have two times all other populations. And we do have 23 schools where that's uh, something that we look at, but 15 that are focused. Um, eight with a placement. And the serious incident dashboard, is that part of the uh, the release that's coming super? Can you remind me again? I'm now getting dashboards messed up. Uh, yeah, we're, we love dashboards. <laughs> um, so the serious incident dashboard is actually an internal tool for district, district administrators, right? Okay. It's how we monitor in real time what's happening at all 210 schools regarding serious incidents. The dashboards that Ms. Sharon was speaking to are public-facing data dashboards, which will include some, you know, disciplinary data, but not at that okay, level. Okay, that's what I was, right? I mean, I can yeah. certainly see why we can't, we, obviously we can't make uh, individual yeah. disciplinary data public, um, but having some way to represent trends so that parents can understand what's going on and where their school figures in that, uh, and, and advocate for the things that they might want and need, uh, that's going to be important also, and, and ma ensuring that the accountability is built in in that way. So that's great to hear that that's going to be part of that, um, and we'll be interested to hear in more detail like what the plan is for what that data will be. Um, the Oh, so the referral process has been one of those pieces that you all have been continuing to work on. We've gotten a lot of, you've gotten a lot of community feedback, uh, understandably. Um, and am I correct to understand that every school has their own referral process at this point now still, after a conflict has occurred? So if a conflict's occurred, it doesn't mean that it automatically comes to us. Right. A lot of schools are equipped locally to handle that, and I shared earlier that 15 schools have CRICMIC on site. Mm -hmm. Conflict Resolution Centers of Montgomery County are on site. We also have schools that are, we're working with University of Maryland, Cary School of Law, on peer mediation practices at certain schools. So because schools have different resources and different abilities, as much as I love us, we are not always um, the call when there is a conflict. So not every hate bias incident goes through us. Most don't. Not every conflict goes through us. Most don't. It's where schools believe that they need um, support and that judgment often comes from your school leadership. On occasionally there's something that might happen that is more community-wide, like impacts a broader group or area within mm -hmm. Montgomery County where the district will engage us, but most are local. But each, so each, and that makes sense. The yeah. referral yeah. process is the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. They have the same, put it in synergy if it's an incident, review it with admin, teacher yeah. referred or admin referred, decide with a group on the consequence or the response, engage external supports as needed. Got it. Yeah, I just, I know we heard from parents that one of the big things that, that they wanted to see is to ensure, and from staff at schools too, was to ensure that there was clarity around as much as is possible, because that's not a s perfect science, uh, that there's some clarity around what kind of incidents should trigger what kind of, of reaction. So that's good that that's been uh, broken down. Um, and I'll just reiterate again before I, I hand it off that, um, you know, those eight schools that have the benefit of those full-time folks where we have really seen uh, a difference, again, especially for our black and African-American students. I want to make sure that we're talking about that as something that we're continuing to aspire to. Uh, we can't just be aiming for maintaining the status quo. Like you said, we have to be continuously improving, and that's a very tangible goal, um, obviously, that has budget implications, but um, I want us to just be talking about that very realistically. If we, uh, you know, if MCPS is uh, 
prioritizing other things. Um, if the council is making decisions based on the, you know, as we have all of those conversations, I just want to make sure that we're being very honest and clear with the public and allowing them to weigh in about their opinions about what, you know, we're all choosing to do and to not do. Because if we're if we're choosing not to put those full-time positions to make those available to those other schools, then we are choosing uh, to, you know, not decrease those suspension rates specifically for our black and African-American students at the same rates that the suspension rates uh, are being decreased for our other students. So let's just be very clear about the budget choices that were the moral choices that we're making within that budget. Thank you, Council Member. If I could, you, you referenced the need for p out parents, uh, stakeholders to know what uh, uh, when an offense occurs, what's an appropriate response. The, the MCPS Code of Conduct, which was revised public on the website, you can any, you probably put MCPS Code of Conduct in Google and find it, that has that spelled out. So if a pal would love parents, for the, you know, the millions at home, as I often hear you all say, that are watching, if somebody gets a call from their school and say, your student is did X and they are the consequences Y, they can refer to that code of conduct for the, the tiered appropriate response. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, turn to Council Member Friesen, Council Vice President Friesen. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, all of the, the, the conversations and the, the questions. Um, first of all, thank you to the principals. We've lost one, but um, you know, it's important that we talk about the things that are going well. I think we also have to acknowledge the things that aren't going well that need to improve and the things that have changed. Uh, so I want to talk about both. So I just start with that. Um, you know, the first is we obviously have three examples here of where it is working exceptionally well, at least from all that I can see and all that I can tell and everything that I understand. Uh, it starts with great principals uh, who are committed to it and are deeply invested in it and building a team around it where everybody is, is part of it. I mean, the, the story of the student losing a parent and the proactive work to meet with the students, even our youngest people. You know, the youngest of children have empathy. Uh, they just need to understand how to use it as a tool to demonstrate their empathy to others and providing them with those tools is really important. So that's just an amazing and heartwarming story and no, no uh, question uh, of why you're the principal of the year. Uh, because of uh, the work that, 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 you, that you're doing. And, you know, I will say I was going to ask Principal Yates, uh, you know, that Google spreadsheet, I mean, this is an example of, like, why isn't that in every school? So there's my first question. Yeah, so the, the lovely thing about the implementation of the coaches is not just their existence in one particular school. One of the things when the coaches were implemented is those hours pay for them to go to a PLC, a professional learning community. It means that those hours will pay for summer training and monthly times where they all come together. And not only do they engage in learning, that they can share resources that they have created. They have, you said earlier, a repository. They have a Canvas page where they can share resources. This is working for us. This is working for us. This is not working for us. And we at the central system are able to look at some of those and take some of those successes. It's one of the reasons we know about Principal Yates, because we're, we're able to see it in the data, not just in person. Um, we're able to take some of that and say, how can we scale this up? Is this something that we can scale up? And even if it works for a high school, would it work for a middle school? Would it work for an elementary school? Would it um, supersede other processes or, that are in place? So we do take a look at it. And that is something that we're working on when we're talking about continuous improvement. Are there things that schools do specifically well um, that we can take and, and expand across the county? Um, there are a lot of decisions that um, include principal autonomy and so how we teach around it how we build it how we encourage it is also important not just how we force it because there may have a school that has something that's working and this would supersede that and that wouldn't work for them so I think what you've said is really important and all I can answer to that is it's something that we're looking at and Damascus High School is identified for that for doing it well and we have shared it with the other coaches as something that can be a model appreciate that but I yeah. you know I think if there is another way to do it I you know I think mm -hmm. it's you know uh, you know process agnostic but outcome focused and yeah. if there's another way if it's on a Google spreadsheet some other spreadsheet fine but that approach is, is an effective approach and it should be implemented uh, more broadly. Let me just, uh, you know, 
to me, the, 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 the cultural aspect of this is the, is the best part of it, right? It, it's the, the change in the mindset here of how we are proactively creating a community and then how we are addressing problems as they occur. Some of the implementation, that's where the challenges uh, come, but the idea of you know, unconditional positive regard, as was mentioned earlier, the preventative community building work, that's clearly a success from my perspective. To me though, and we've heard it a little bit, restorative justice is like medicine. It can be part of healing, but if not done the right way, if not handled with care and with sensitivity and with training and with understanding, it can do a lot of harm. And that's where I, I really think we need to, to focus on. Uh, that is not a criticism of any individual in this process, but a reflection of there have been some real serious implementation challenges as part of uh, restorative justice, at least from, from uh, my perspective. And some changes have been made as a result of that, which I think is important. So the, the next question is, how have we communicated some of the changes that have been made to families, to, to parents, to students to ensure that there is faith in this process and that people understand that changes are being made. You want to answer that? She definitely will answer better. But at a school <laughs> level, um, at both at Goshen and at Kevin Branch, I believe in PTA meetings with meaning. So we have the PTA portion and then we always have staff led presentations. Last year we did it and this year we're doing it on Tuesday. It's based around restorative practices because we do have the naysayers. There are parents that I'm talking to that, hey, this happened, this is what we did. And they want to hear the suspension. They do want to hear what was the punishment and don't believe in it. So what we're doing is, yes, we're presenting the information in the background and then we're doing circles with the parents and then having a question, Q&A, what needs to be improved? What are we missing? How can we improve? And I'm happy to share that. I invited the restorative practice coach and social worker that is supporting Cabin Branch to come as well. But I think that's a huge part of it is including them in it and having them see it and live it to give us feedback on a family portion to see um, so they have the knowledge, but also hear from their perspective so then we can use that to move forward. I appreciate that. You want to chime in? I would say, um... You know, I know it's challenging, but in order for restoration to occur, you have to want it. And so if you don't want to fix something that's broken, it, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how trauma informed, how many clinicians are present. If you don't want it, it's not going to be restored. So I think that's important, but I think that's where tightening process is to examine where it is wanted or who wants it or who is ready for it is really important. So I, I appreciate your acknowledgement of that. Um, and we are working with different groups about some of those concerns. Um, I've had the privilege of working with uh, Ms. Sarah Winkleman in a few instances um, in order to not just get feedback, uh, but consult about some of the things that are happening. Um, I've invited in um, several different groups to work with not just us, but the RJ coaches in order to get, gather perspectives within our community in order to make some of those changes. Um, I will say from the study, that first bullet commitment, we have a hard time with that. We have a, we have a hard time with that. Um, and it's gonna go back to us in order to make sure that we're educating our communities, but also showing them, right? Showing them why this works so that they do want that restoration. Um, the other piece of this is you asked about what we've done specifically. So I talked about the website a little bit, making public who the coaches are. That's really important to some of our families. They wanna know who's doing the work. Uh, we've also made public what our trainings are. We've made public too, we have a parents canvas page and an RJ coach canvas page. It's open and accessible to everyone. We've shared some of our framework and, and guidance documents. I think they're like 109 pages. <laughs> we, we could reduce that a little bit. We've, we've shared some of those. We've created one pager quick guides for showing the process. Uh, those just say, first there's an incident. Here's what happens. Here's who we will call. Here's how we'll engage consent. And those quick guides are scheduled to be on our website as well. We've put in a request, it takes a little while. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing based on hearing from of our, our community, not just to improve implementation, but also to try to win some of our communities so that we have that commitment. Right. Um, I think there's two pieces. So 
one piece is just the general idea of restorative practices. Yeah, it's hard. Right? And and that is a, a broad sales pitch that needs to happen. And it's going to take a lot of work to, you know, talk about the idea of restorative approaches versus a more punitive practice. And, and I think you have to acknowledge that zero tolerance, as was mentioned earlier, is a lot easier to communicate. You know, the discretion, which is really kind of the secret sauce in restorative approaches to make sure you're figuring out what works to restore in that particular moment is also the area that is the most challenging to communicate and is also the reason why over communicating as much as you possibly can uh, is is uh, so critical. But the, the main concerns that I have heard on restorative practices are one, the voluntary element of it and whether or not the people who were in it really wanted to be in it. And then the damage that was caused when there were people who participated who really didn't want to participate. And whether they were coerced into participating, or they didn't understand why they were participating, or what they had agreed to, uh, or uh, that you know th that that is that is part of it, and 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 the trauma that was caused and the harm that was caused because people in what was supposed to be a restorative and safe space further traumatized, further caused harm uh, to the people who were already uh, victimized. The other area that that has not been talked about as much today are on hate bias incidents and where there are real challenges in being able to facilitate a hate bias related conflict with very nuanced sensitivity to understand what are the trigger words what are the things that are being said that could be causing further harm you know what are the things that people are going to get upset about if you don't if, if you're not trained to identify it and and know it then you could be causing more harm, and that's a real area of, of concern. I know you've had lots of conversations with external groups. You mentioned some of them uh, already, which is important, but, but that's a real area, the, the voluntary element and the cultural competency to deal with particular hate bias incidents and making sure that we're only focusing on these areas when we know we can get it right, because we heard from our expert, I think just uh, you know stepped out that um, if done well, it works really well, but if done not well, it can be very damaging and cause a, a lot of challenges. And that's where the specific staff matters, as uh, Councilmember Mink talked about, the subject matter expertise, the training, uh, the, the nuance. So I, I just, if you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, start. If, if I could start off, and I think um, <clears throat> I'll start with the, the second point about the nuances that you made some very good points, council member, about the nuances of the hate or the bias and whether it is uh, racial hate, if it's religious hate, if it's um, you know gender identity hate, whatever it may be, that these are nuanced. Um, and I think it's it's important to remember, right, that as this was folded into the district, um, it was about. If, if, if it was to be about an incident, those incidents were traditional school incidents, right? Not necessarily involving hate and bias incidents, right? So a fight or somebody calls somebody a name, not a racial name, whatever, things such as that nature. Um, what has occurred, right, over the last year is that some of our principals have said, this has been very effective, right, if I'm dealing with the traditional incident. So I'm going to reach out and request that support. I think I, I know the incident that you're referring to specifically. And, and so we, up, straight up, we learned a lot from that, okay? And I think uh, beyond that, what we have seen globally and within our local context and the nuance that we're dealing with, I too had the opportunity to sit on Tuesday night with the Anti-Hate Task Force, was part of that back in July and August as well from the beginning. These are very difficult times. Montgomery County looks like Midtown Manhattan, or not Midtown, all of Manhattan. We are as diverse as anywhere in the country. And I think that the point that I, I really want to let everybody know here is this is work that we are doing right now and not just Shauna Kay and I, or Mr. Ambie and I. So um, we do have a team with the equity office who was here prior for the anti-racist audit where we are working right now with external partners and to train and teach our leaders at the district level and then our principals about the nuances involved specifically with what we are seeing in the world today um, but with all these different forms of hate. We know, we are, we know that we are, it, we are first and foremost a teaching and learning organization 
But in order for us to be able to be effective in teaching and learning, we've got to adapt in real time and learn about all of these experiences you're talking about so we can appropriately support them. So I, I want to fully acknowledge the, the, what you just said there and also just state that this is work. We have a cross-office team that is looking is working with folks outside the district right now between equity, school support, and well-being and our, our office to identify um, and to be able to provide specifics right on each of these nuanced areas of hate, not just to our RJ folks, but to our equity folks and our all of our school directors and to our principals and to our teachers, perhaps most importantly. And that is a huge, drastic leap in the scope of work that public school systems have been asked to do um, historically and specifically over the last couple of years. We are in new territory, and I think as, as Councilmember Jawanda said, we are happy to be on the tip of that spear, but when you're on the tip of that spear, you're the, uh, you're the front line of that battle, and that's where we are now. And so I just want to acknowledge that and appreciate the comment um, because it's real and we're working on it. I appreciate it. I get back in the queue, I'll yield back, and I appreciate the response. Thank you. Yeah, tip of the spear. You, sometimes people get cut too, and, and, and it's a you know it's, it's a really good point. Um, all right, I'm going to uh, ask one question, then go to my colleagues. We'll go back again. We're going to stop at five, no matter what. Um, connection. I'm glad you're still here, principals. How does this connect to de dealing with other more serious incidents? In this, so the question I'm asking is, you have people that go through the RJ process and 80% aren't reoffending or re having another incident, right? And it's and you're seeing a reduction in suspensions. It, it, talk about the connection to the overall school climate. Uh, it was mentioned that some of the climate surveys match up with the schools that are doing this well. I'm assuming that was to suggest that some of those climates are better. We, I would love to see that, that data. Uh, but specifically for the principals, and, and the other MCPS staff can jump in too. Does this help you manage other parts of the job? And if you could say no, but does it reduce or give you expanded capacity to deal with other things? I'll start. You know, mine. Yes. So uh, absolutely, um, and I say that because you know the importance of modeling the work around restorative justice is that. It is not just something that teachers do with students or when two students have a conflict, adults have conflict. And now I have a tool, right? There was a time when two teachers were having an issue and I'm like, okay, let's sit in my office and then I'm like judge and jury, right? But when you sit in circle, we're talking about the harm, we're talking about how people felt, what were you thinking when it happened, what are you thinking about now? And oftentimes I have to say very little but manage that space and then those adults come to it. That's a tool I didn't have before, right? So being able to actually use that in my practice, so now I'm able to manage when there's a conflict with adults, use the exact same tool. I mean, it hasn't been as easy with the parents because, you know, they're coming in and they're like, what, what are we doing here, right? Um, they're coming in with a, a very, you know, limited perspective around what restorative justice is. But in some cases when we've used it, it has. I know it's been some, some challenges in some other spaces, um, but it has become a tool for us. Um, so we are able to use it in, in these other spaces. And again, when there's an issue, if it's with me or maybe I might have said something, might have offended someone or done something, let's sit in circle. So I didn't traditionally have that tool. Um, and it was, again, one of those spaces where sometimes folks said, hey, I want to go get my union person. We're going to have a talk with the principal. I, I have very little of that because now folks say, okay, I have a voice in this particular space. I want to give you a number. Um, so last year of that 878 number that I gave you, we measure incidents in that we call it the serious incidents database, but it, it includes incidents that rise to um, calling central office and reporting it, uh, to calling uh, police officials and things like that. I want to balance that out for you. 40 of those incidents in the dispositions that were handled restoratively out of 878 were what we would consider a high-level serious incident. Something so, that might require a police response or something. Maybe. N not yeah. all. Okay. The, or sometimes it's medical response. Medical you might have a student who requires an emo uh, uh, emergency petition yeah. uh, if there is a dysregulation that... 
um, needed that. Um, so it's not all police, but it required it to be reported to central office or an outside agency. So of the 878 handled restoratively, 40 of those rose to that level. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to pause, turn to colleagues. Council Member Uh Yeah, yeah um, so, you know, as we're continuing to evolve and adapt, um, you know, tough, uh, it's the elephant in the room. Tough budget decisions are going to have to be made, obviously. Um, and not just in this, but many different spaces <laughs> going into FY25. Um, and, and as we scale up, because we won't be able to do everything all at once, and, and we'll, we'll be happy if we sustain what we currently have, and if there's any way we can build off of it, we certainly want to explore that. But I'd just be curious as to how, how will you all make decisions on which schools or where we go next? Um, what benchmarks will you utilize? There'll be the obvious data <laughs> where there are more issues of suspension, more, more conflict, if you will. Um, but what are some other data points that you may utilize? Because, you know, and I'll just end with this example. You know, when we first launched Excel Beyond the Bell, we couldn't do it everywhere. We right. just couldn't. We, we couldn't afford to do it everywhere. And so we picked the schools initially where the principals got it, they leaned in, they viewed it as an asset, and they wanted it. Um, and so I just, how are you going to determine in this next phase, assuming we can sustain what we've got, and I know we want to and add to it, but what will that look like? So that's a wonderful question, and the EVB example was great because we were one of those original schools, and we came and spoke to the council about um, the need for it to continue. So you're correct, right? So there are spaces where we have leadership, where it, sometimes it's not even within leadership, staff that have that critical mass that um, can carry forth that work without as much support. And so there's a number of factors. I'm gonna start with the evaluation. The evaluation taught us things that we just didn't know, right? And one of those is those reactive schools. So those reactive schools are not all disproportionate schools. And we wouldn't have caught them if we were just looking at dispro, right? So starting with those 20 schools and just getting the work started <laughs> is, is gonna be an important focus. The next set of schools are early schools. We have about 60% of our schools that are actually still in the early phase. And while that's appropriate in the phase of implementation we're in, we can't stay there, right? And so looking at those as well. Um, we are committed to a district-wide model. Um, I know that a lot of other districts are not there yet, but we really can't afford to go back to serving very few schools and hoping everybody else is okay. So again, we're gonna use the evaluation as a primary tool. We're always gonna have to look at DISPRO. We do look at climate data and we look at school to school capacity. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else? Council Member May. Thanks, yeah, I mean, I would leave open the possibility of expansion personally because this, um, not my decision, but I'm gonna put it out there anyway, um, because this is something that has so many tangible impacts on so many of the metrics that we are working to make improvements on. When we take kids out of the classroom, um, you know, this is, uh, this is part of the school to prison pipeline that we've been talking about. This is gonna have uh, learning loss impacts. Um, and um, you know, th there's just so many different pieces that this touches. And now, uh, obviously MCPS is doing a lot of work to make improvements in all of those different areas, a multitude of different ways. And the question is gonna ultimately be, what has the most impact and what are we gonna choose, what are we gonna choose to fund? But I would absolutely keep this on the table because we have good data that it works. So, you know, I think as we continue getting closer to the budget season, um, I have no doubt that uh, the Board of Ed will be digging into this as well, but um, I hope that we, that you continue to bring those conversations here and share with us how, um, you know, uh, how MCPS is, is making those comparisons, and obviously this is not, not just for you, but uh, I do think that this should be, you know, restorative justice should be considered uh, when we're having those conversations about how are we impacting, uh, how are we making improvements in, as we look at the school to prison pipeline situation, as we look at learning loss and keeping kids in the classroom, uh, and as we look at the budgetary decisions and choices, our menus of options, uh, this should absolutely be on there. So um, I, would, I would encourage all of us to continue seeing seeing those connections and considering this as a, a very valid possibility. Um, 
wanted to thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, wanted to uh, oh wanted to to let you know that I've been hearing from some students that there are students who don't even know that restorative justice is in their, those schools. I'm sure that there's some stuff that you know tracks with uh, whether we've got a full-time specialist or whether we've got a very busy teacher who's stipended to do extra stuff on the side. I'm sure that there's some correlations there. Um, but we're not going to have a full-time person in every school. Uh, so do you have thoughts about what are you working on to improve student um, knowledge of restorative justice being in their schools? They're, they may be experiencing the effects of it without even knowing it. Um, but what's being done to expand the knowledge of it and to hopefully uh, increase their engagement in it? And additionally, um, to leverage their input about how, they, how you, we can continue to improve the program. That is super fair. Um, we hear that not just with our RJ specialists, we sometimes hear that with our uh, social workers. I know that is an initiative that our student member of the board cares very much about in being able to identify those supports. So I want to say that that's an area we're working on across a number of spaces. Um, this year, for the first time, identifying those coaches. Like, we don't tell everyone um, who's stipended for what in every school, but we did that for RJ on the RJ site. So you can go on, you can see the school, you can see the coach, you can see the specialists. So having some direct access to that um, has been helpful. Um, the second thing is the continuation of the student groups. The first one is really well established, the RJ uh, peer voices. The second one is <coughs> newly developing for this year, and we're still working on making sure we have more represented voices. So that's those are two two things that are in the works. Sorry, and peer voices, could you just yeah. very briefly? Sure. Thanks. RJ Peer Voices was started last year. It's voluntary. It's a student group. Um, it's virtual. It's a virtual club. And they meet once a month to hear information about um, how restorative practices can be implemented in their schools, what are their roles as students, things like that. So they, they meet to engage with us around um, school issues that might require restoration. Um, the, the second group um, now meets about dispro suspensions as well as restorative practices. Again, we've only met twice, not not really well established yet, but that's an area that we're looking to grow as well. Um, Canvas uh, monthly newsletters is a way we got that out there last year, and we can see the engagement with that, pushing messages through Canvas. Um, and then letting students know that their coach doesn't have to be initiated through administration or through central office, right? We're seeing a little bit of that now with the parents now that we've put that out there. And just continuing to educate. It's on us to continue to create those videos and those those uh, moments where kids can learn in snippets what's available to them. If students want to get engaged in those groups and participate in the conversation, um, how should they? So we push it out through a student newsletter in Canvas that we, we did every other month last year. And we send it out through flyers. We also send it to all the coaches. The coaches There's share like contact their... information or something, an email yeah. that they start. Um, so, yes, I would say you can email uh, Miss uh, Bethlehem Baru or Dr. Tariq Harris, who um, who lead those groups. Great. It would be great as as you're putting out stuff on Canvas and so on uh, about with information about the engagement that you're doing with students to also have something in there that says if you too want to be a part of this, mm -hmm. um, easy way to potentially uh, pull some other kids in. That's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Just really quick, we have a student intern in our office, and I was getting the message that it's it's not that they in this case it's not that they don't know about the program; it's that it's a little complicated to access. Like there are a lot of hoops that they have to go through. Um, and so it was so many hoops that in, in one specific instance, they weren't sure that this was the right thing for them. So just another aspect to think about. I like that you said that because I think we have to balance that, right? When we're talking about the consents and the all the different pieces, um, we have to be careful as we are uh, listening to feedback from one group, we're not creating barriers to another. Right. So a student now is saying that I want to do this but we are like, okay, you've got to get consent to do this. It's kind of a balance, right? And you don't, they don't get consent to talk to their counselors, right. but so there's, there's a nuance there that is we're still working out. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll just add quickly that um, at our school, we, you know, we had QR codes at one point now, just a URL where students can actually just request a restorative conversation. And, you know, we would still need to get both parties to agree, but oftentimes they're getting in front of the problem even before it's created. They're saying, hey, something was said online, and I want to talk with this student about it. We're like, 
when we see that, we get really excited, right? Because that, that means it's, it's working. That's what we want to see. Another best practice. Freezing. Yeah, agreed. I love the idea. The QR code, another example of like, let's lean into things that are working and eliminate things that aren't working. Um, j just a quick thing on the website, um, it is hard to access. If you go on the restorative justice website, you then have to click, you have to find in the middle of the page, there's a click here, then you click there and then it takes you to a Google spreadsheet and the Google spreadsheet has every single school, yes. not the 28 schools, and then it lists out. So I couldn't, when I looked at it, I couldn't really tell you what the 28 schools are that you're even talking about. I mean, it would take a long time for an ordinary person to figure so that you out. Can, you can access that at, at your RJ coach at any school. Every school has an RJ coach. Right. So that's it, it's not just the 28 or just the, the eight that the specialists are at. Specialists are listed for their clusters and often, again, yeah, I'm just pointing out that yep. it's very confusing you, you to, to understand that even based on, you know, multiple hours you're, of conversation. You're 100 percent right. Our website is right now yeah. under review. It so, is. It yeah. right no the need second for, yeah, like, I, I get updated. it. But like that's an area where if we're trying to make this more accessible <laughs> yep. to more people, we agree with that you. would be a good opportunity <laughs> to do that. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, 878 uh, and the 40 being what you classified as serious. Do you have a determination of how many of those have been hate bias, responses to hate bias incidents? So I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I do not know at this time. I would typically just uh, text Carla and ask her, and um, I don't know how fast she can pull that up. Um, I will say last year's data, which I can speak to a little bit better, I think there's an impression in the county that we handle a lot of hate bias incidents. It's it's not many. It, it, it doesn't... Um, yeah, I think it's that a it, few of not. the hate bias incidents that were handled this way were not yeah, it, did not it, work it, out as well as we would have liked, and so it has caused it, a lot of concern. And so I think that's why the data would be helpful in that sure. sense. I also think it would be helpful to see in the broader context of all the hate bias incidents that have happened. So, like, what is the proportion of restorative justice responses on, on incidents on dispositions are hate bias? Number one, and number two, uh, of the total hate bias reported incidents that occur in MCPS schools, mm -hmm. how many of them have gone through this process? I think those two data points, we don't need them right now, but if you could follow up with us, I think that would be uh, helpful because I'm, I'm carefully monitoring um, uh, the, 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 the time here. Uh, one thing that ha has been raised previously that, uh, to me that, that hasn't come up is the power dynamics in a restorative justice practice. We've talked about students to students. We've talked about even teachers to teachers uh, when there's an incident and being able to lean into these practices where it has worked well. Uh, what's your view on an incident that involves a student and a teacher or an incident where it involves a boss and a subordinate? Um, is, that, is, is that something where a standard restorative justice practice incident response would be appropriate? And how would you handle that differently based on a power dynamic. So I, I, I will just do the, the boss or the supervisor to the subordinate first and foremost. So if, if that is a different process that, that does not involve, if it's a, if something formal normally that does not involve um, restorative approaches whatsoever. So, and that is something that the district, that we, that different district office would work on, um, compliance and investigations. So I, I think that's 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 separate in terms. I think, um, and I'm, I'm going to hand it over to, to Mr. Aldrich because it, when I was a principal, I too used it with staff on staff conflict. I mean, it can be something about like how many assessments we're giving this sure. semester, right? Sure. These are the kinds of things that people argue about. And so you're going to get you're going to get two two staff members together, teammates. Yeah, uh, yeah and right? I think we've talked about that. Two so, staff members of but the know, relative the, equal. It standing. absolutely can be applied two for students. a teacher or a staff member and a student. And I think. I mean, I, I, I would say I offer it to teachers all the time. To, cause, and, and generally, it's not something as serious as like hate bias or something like that. But for example, a, a teacher may say, hey, I don't think Mr. Arch likes me because he saw me in the hall and didn't say anything. Right? And what I found is. I mean, a student said that. No, a teacher would say that. To, to About a student. No, we'll say that I think about that's me. That's what he's asking about. No, I'm just talking about me and the teacher. For example, I'm the principal and the teacher, right? Yeah that I'll supervise them and things of that nature. So what we would do, well, not what I, but someone else would say, hey, have you had a chance to see if you want to do a restorative conversation with Mr. Orridge? The reality is for that to work requires culture building. Right. For our teachers and our students were able to sit in circle to say, a, t a student felt confident enough to say, 
you offended me when you said this or when you, you know. So said creating that, I, that safe space is very hard to do. Like that that's the cultural piece absolutely. that's important. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, just, this is work. I want to note that because there, there are times where I have become aware that a power dynamic existed and, you know, potential harm being done. And, and I, I know that that's, you know, something that we've talked about, you know, understanding implementation and, and working through some of these uh, dynamics. But there is heightened sensitivity when there is a power dynamic because the goal here is to repair and not to cause harm. And I just think that is very important. My last question, I know I'm at time here. Um, you talked about the after surveys. So we talked about consent on the front end and the after surveys. Is that for um, the alleged offender exclusively? Does that include no, the, the, it, the uh, alleged victims? It's anyone that participated in the process. So if it was formal, I'm being clear about the formal, if it was formal a process, and you participated in it, whether you were a process observer or a participant, you are a, You can fill out that survey. It provides us with two tiers of information about your experience and then also feedback for the facilitator. Got it, okay, yep. I appreciate that. We all have lots more questions. I appreciate the work, but I understand the time and uh, look forward to continuing the, the dialogue. So I'll yield back and thank you for the indulgence. Thank you. Council Member Mink has 15 Super seconds. Super quick comment um, on that. Just wanted to note that that's an, another reason that I think that we should consider uh, keep on the table an expansion uh, because as we look at hate bias incidents, for example, as we look at you know just violence uh, and, and that kind of thing, we look at the the reduction of these incidents. If they're not repeating these incidents, these are fewer incidents that are happening in our schools. Like, and we know that this is effective. Reduction in hate bias incidents happening to somebody there full time. You're not going to be able Able to build the kind of culture that Mr. Elrich is describing uh, with somebody who doesn't have the time. So these are the benefits that I think we need to continue to consider. Thanks. And I did want to say about the, co the, the power dynamic, RJ often opens up a shift in power dynamic. It, teachers are entitled already to speak to kids. Like Teachers can say, hey, Stacy, come on over here. Let's have a conversation. That power dynamic already exists. Mm -hmm. What RJ now provides is the opposite. Yeah. You, have te you have kids now that can say, I felt disrespected by Miss Such and So, and I'm asking for this. And so it, it's not just in one direction. So I, I do understand what that that means, but it also it's two sided. It, it opens both. Yeah, and like I said, if yes. done right, yes. if it, it, you know, if if it works, I think it works really, really well. But if it doesn't work, and we heard this from an expert, and I know all of you would attest to this, it can cause a lot of harm. And any time we engage in these very difficult conversations, it can re-victimize people, it can cause additional harm. And so that's where making sure that it's done in the way that you suggest is important because you know causing additional harm is the last thing that anybody wants to do. So thank you. No, I appreciate that. And and this is a great conversation. I'm glad we were able to do it again. We'll come back again and budget and talk about this, obviously. I do want to say that it's worth the risk in my view to have the difficult conversations. And and we need to do it right. Uh, to Councilmember Mink's point and Councilmember Friesen's point, we need to do it right. We need to have the right training with the right sensitivity. Uh, but, it, but we have to do it. There, there's so much upside to doing it and getting it right. And you're not gonna get it right if you don't train people to do it right and you don't expand it and do it right. Uh, and that's why I asked the question about is it freeing you up to do other things. If we're reducing, if most of those incidents are fights and disruption and things that we hear about complaints, we had a youth town hall yesterday, safety complaints. If this can reduce that and have people who are involved in those antisocial behaviors not do it again and reduce disparities at the same time and provide us another tool in the toolbox, not the only tool, to deal with rising hate bias, for example, appropriately done, taught by people in a safe space that is a, a risk worth taking with the data we have, I think. And so I, I, I would send that back to the school system and uh, to folks as we go forward and we're going through the budget at a really difficult time. I think this is a, uh, a, key, a key toolbox, tool in the toolbox. The principal of the largest middle school in our county uh, at um, Julius West, I said, if you could ask me, if we, didn't, we weren't even talking about restorative justice. I said, I asked all at all my tours, I said, if you could get anything from me, if I was a, could w grant you a wish for a day, 
what would it or for, for a wish what would it be he said to allow my rj coordinator who's a stipend teacher who has classes four classes to be full-time that was the one thing he said reactively uh, at the largest one of the most diverse schools in the county so uh, thank you all for all that you're doing and thank you my colleagues uh, with that we're adjourned mm -hmm. On northbound I-270 from Clarksburg Road, Maryland.